Um, we have um, a few members are, are running late due to traffic, and I understand that Miss Anderson will be joining us via Starleaf. Yeah, Starleaf, yeah. <laughs> Um, today's meeting we will be considering subordinate legislation. We will have a briefing from Belfast International Airport on the financial impact of COVID-19 on the airport, um, departmental briefing on flood management plans, um, briefing including reservoirs, and we will also have briefings from Assembly Research and Information Service in relation to electric vehicle, waste and water and sewage company business models in both um, GB and um, the Irish Republic. Um, we don't have any apologies um, with regards to Chairman's business. Um, obviously our meeting took place on Monday morning with a number of um, representatives from the taxi industry, those who had contacted us with the drivers in relation to um, the, the support um, which, is, which is currently being um, um, applied for and distributed via um, via the department. Um, most members were, were at that meeting and it was a useful discussion. There is a, um, a, a readout of that meeting at our table papers at page four and we've also an email which came through from um, Connor McGin McGinley just in relation to taxi driver insurance that was coming through from um, Abbey Auto Line. Um, if members um, just want to have a, a brief discussion as to, to what our next steps are, um, this was one of the easiest things that we could do is actually just get um, is send that sort of readout to um, the department just for to highlight the, the main issues, which were primarily with regards to the criteria around insurance and how that's then become. It's actually quite quite significant now. We were talking around about a third of the drivers who were essentially advised to reduce their costs yeah. and may then be prohibited from getting the, um, the grant. Um, Mr. Boyle. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I think, Chair, it was a useful discussion and, mm -hmm. and was enough of us there to, to obviously uh, listen to the concerns. I would, I certainly have some sympathy for it. I mean, 30% of the industry. And I mean, uh, the, the issue for us now is, um, and I do agree with sending the papers on note, but the issue for us is this was in regulation. And how then is it a case now we write to the department? How do we change that regulation? If, if, the, if the criteria is in regulation itself. So it's a, major, it's a major issue for us. So, I mean, I would be supportive of looking at how we would do that. So, can we put that in the letter, or do we have to write and ask for advice first? Or well, I think that we can't. We can't put. We can put that in the in the right in in writing. I think to the minister just to ask for them to look at how this can be um, looked at in order to allow for those to be eligible. Um, I suppose in all of these things, we have to be mindful of the, of, of the fact that there's an there's an audit process in all of this too. Yeah. Um, so it's about making sure that that's that's kept in a such a way that it keeps everyone right, but at the same time ensuring that those who, who do need this and, um, and, and, are, and are entitled to it in many respects should no, get the, it. The, the, most of that 30 per cent are definitely entitled to the payment. So I mean, I would be supportive of writing the minister, be supportive yeah. of looking at just insurance. overdoing that insurance yeah. criteria. Yeah. And the point, I think the point was well made with regards to those who had insurance on the 22nd yes. of March. Yeah. Yeah, on the 23rd, the then yeah. the industry basically came to yeah. to a standstill. Um, but to see, and I think we have, we've obviously made that, those representations um, over the last number of weeks. Yeah. But I suppose it's really just to to reinforce that, given um, the discussion that we had on Monday, and and I think also that email that's come through um, via Connor has been very useful. And I I, I got that yesterday um, myself, and I, and I forwarded it through to the private office. Um, in advance of this, um, just to ensure that they had that as well. So, if members are content, then that we that we do that. Um, that's agreed. Agreed. Um, thank you. <coughs> Moving then to our draft minutes at page six, and that's for the meeting of the 25th of November. Are members content? Agreed. Moving then to matters arising again for the meeting of the 25th of November. Um, do members have any issues um, arising from that meeting? They wish to highlight. No, nope, not content. At page 21, we have outstanding um, committee requests for information. So that's quite a, a lengthy list now. Um, so, if, um, is there anything? Is anything jumping out, members, with regards to that? I think quite a bit of it. There's, there's some of it actually is is overdue. So um, we may want to maybe just send 
further reminders um, yeah. on that as well. Okay, moving then to um, correspondence. Just draw your attention to correspondence memo at page 36 and tabled at page 8. Um, at page 9, we have the interim report from the examiner's statutory rules, Angela Kelly highlighting one SR, and that's SR 2020-249, the Taxi Driver Coronavirus Financial Assistance Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Um, the committee agreed this statutory rule is subject to the examiner's report. The examiner has now advised that she'll draw special attention of the Assembly to um, this SR in the report in respect of the breach of the 21-day rule. However, she is content that the Department has provided a satisfactory explanation in respect of the breach on this occasion. So members are, are satisfied with that. Um, are there any other items of correspondence that members um, wish to draw attention to? We have had correspondence, we have a number of piece of correspondence obviously from Sola, San and Nilga. Um, uh, and I'm not sure whether members would be content that at some stage that we, we schedule them for a, a briefing. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? Uh, it, we ha also have a correspondence there from um, Bridge Taxis in Antrim, um, and their concern is in relation to the, the financial support for the taxi industry. So I suppose, again, if we can forward that through to, to the department. Mm. Yeah, just one thing. The letter came through from Sustrans. I would declare that previously an employee of Translink, but uh, it was about the North West Transport Hub in Derry, London. Derry said we were going to write to the department around the resourcing for the active travel hub, and I think that's important that we raise that because that transport hub's not finished until that's done. That's right. There's an issue just in relation yeah. to um, revenue for staffing and so yeah, on. Yeah. Okay, members content, Mrs. Kelly. If you no, I'm, I'm just uh, sorry. No, I was just thinking you know, about the taxi industry. You know, I think we have to remember that we're quite unique in having this financial package uh, for them, and because they don't have it in England or Wales or the Republic, you know, and in Scotland it's only three hundred fifty pounds. You know, so I don't think we should be too hard on ourselves in trying to be able to assist at times. You know. No, no, I think that's right. But at the same time, I suppose if. If there is an issue that's um, oh no, it's quite that's right. creating a problem. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like that, yeah. Yeah. Or actually, we should. I can go. understand why people drop the cost of insurance. That's what you do when you find yourself in money. Yeah, you, you cut your cloth. Yeah, yeah. You cut particularly your... in the middle. Yeah. Particularly in the middle yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah, it's up absolutely. For there's no end in sight. Yeah. No, there are leads away again. Then. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Not sports um, personality. <laughs> <laughs> Moving then to subordinate legislation, um, <laughs> item six. That's SL one, which is not subject to assembly proceedings. At page one hundred and seventy, so we have SL one, the parking places on roads and waiting restrictions, Newry Amendment number two, order, Northern Ireland twenty twenty. The proposals are not subject to assembly proceedings. The rule will introduce no waiting restriction between eight thirty and six fifteen p.m. Monday to Saturday, on a length of Windmill Road, Newry. Vehicles are accepted um, from the restriction in certain circumstances. The proposal is being introduced <coughs> excuse me, with the intention of preventing all-day parking and improving the free flow of through traffic. Are members content with the proposals in the rule? Okay. Item number seven, the Planning Environmental Assessments and Technical Miscellaneous Amendments, EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, at page 173. The proposals are subject to negative resolution procedure. The decision... The UK decision to withdraw from the European Union will have an impact on the legal certainty and operability of planning legislation, which is various, just transposed various requirements from a number of EU directives. To remedy these impacts, planning has already progressed a number of legislative amendments through a UK statutory instrument, SA, in 2018, in the absence of a sitting Northern Ireland Assembly. Since the making of the SI, a number of other issues of minor technical nature have been identified for amendment via this SR in order to ensure that the retained planning EU legislation is, is legally certain and continues to operate effectively after the withdrawal of the UK from the EU. So are members content with the proposals for yeah. the statutory realm? Yeah. Thank you. SR 2020-276, the Port Services Amendment EU Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 4th of November. 
and was content that the rule is subject to a negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? Yeah. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-276, the Port Services Amendment EU reg Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Read. Item 9, SR 2020-277, the Railways Amendment EU mm. Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and it's page 196. The Committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 4th of November and was content the rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Okay. Uh, the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-277, the Railways Amendment EU Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Item 10, SR 2020-286, the Bus Operator Coronavirus Financial Assistance Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, as a page 206. The Committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 4th of November was content. The rule was sub is subject to negative resolution. It is recognised the Department has not complied with the 21-day rule in setting an operational date of the 27th of November, and it apologises for this breach. However, while regrettable, the Department believes that the breach was unavoidable as urgent action was required in view of the determination made by the First and Deputy First Minister acting jointly on the 3rd of November 2020. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the Committee. Are members content with this rule? Chair, just, is, that, is this the bus operator one? Yeah. Yes, it is. The coach? <coughs> yes. <coughs> Just um, maybe find out if they discuss the this, the criteria with the um, mm, mm, mm. with the coach operators because the the insurance criteria isn't sitting with this, you know. So I mean, just we I will agree the rule today. Okay, we can agree it's subject <coughs> to. Subject to absolutely, yeah, because okay, I mean the, so the criteria, the insurance criteria is not on this, and just what discussions did they have with the actual coach bus? Operator industry, you know. Okay, so it's a question. So the, agree the rule, yeah. So the committee has considered SR twenty twenty two eight two, the bus operator coronavirus financial assistance regulations, um, Northern Ireland twenty twenty, and subject to the examiner statutory rules. And um, sorry, chair, but that hold it up anyway. I'm not sure. You see, that's the problem. Yeah. You know, no, no, no. We agree the rule. All, all, all we're doing is asking. All I'm doing is ask the question. But say it's not subject to. It's no, not subject it's a, to. Say question. But say clarification of. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's so and with, we have no objection to the subject to the exam statutory rule, but in addition to that, we would actually like some further clarification that's just all. in yeah. relation yeah. yeah. so to that's all. Yeah. 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 No problem. Uh, there was a query that came through from um, Karen McGill from Dutch and Coach Northern Ireland around the criteria. But I sent that off to the minister in terms of a written question and got a clarity back, and didn't hear anything more back from Karen in relation to that. So obviously, there's a balance here in terms of getting, and, and well, I think we're on the same page. No, no, I think so. Yeah. It's not. It's yeah. just it's quite, making sure that there isn't any delay then to the broader industry. Well, no, we're not. We're not yeah. delaying the road. It's a long time. It's yeah. Clear, yeah. Okay, so you're, you're content with that. Okay. Moving then to. Um, Agenda item is 18, just in relation to your, in your table papers. So it's SL1, the Motor Vehicles Driving Licences Amendment Number 2, Coronavirus Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, tabled at um, table pages um, 14. And the proposals are subject to negative resolution procedure. The purpose of the proposed statutory rule is to extend the validity of theory test pass certificates, which expire between the 1st of November 2020 and the 30th of June 2021 by eight months, and to extend by an additional four months the validity of those certificates which have already received an eight-month um, extension. So are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Content. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Moving then to our first briefing. Um, so we're a briefing from the Belfast International Airport. Um, at page 221, we have a letter from um, the airport requesting to brief the committee, particularly in relation to the impact of COVID on the airport. At page 11 in our table papers, we also have a letter from the department setting out the extent of the powers that the department has in relation to airports. 
Um, just for members' information, Hansard will record the meeting. Um, and can I welcome um, our, our guests to the, um, the meeting this morning? We've got Graham Keady, the Managing Director of Belfast International Airport, and um, Emmanuel Metentau. Sorry, apologies for the <laughs> pronunciation, if that's incorrect. So that's the Chairman of Belfast International Airport. So you're both very welcome to our committee this morning. Thank you, Madam Chairman. If you don't mind, I'll make an opening statement and then Emmanuel will come in. Um, you know, thank you for meeting us at such short notice. Um, it's greatly appreciated and I thank you for recognising the urgency of the issue. Emmanuel is our, our chairperson and uh, the regional director of the Vonsey Airport. As you can imagine, BFS is a member of the Vonsey network where all the airports are, are suffering from the effects of COVID. I mean, everybody is asking support from their respective government and many of the network are getting that support. Put things in the context, Europe, uh, the situation is so bad that Airports Council International estimates that 200 airports are on the brink of collapse in, uh, in Europe. Um, we come before you today to ask the, government, the committee's help in securing urgent and much needed financial support for the airports. COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on the aviation sector across the world and also here in Northern Ireland. Anyone watching the news over recent months will be aware of the steps we've had to take in order to keep the doors open. We'll also be aware that there are three commercial airports in Northern Ireland. However, we are unique. It's the only facility that can operate two runways all year round, 24-7 basis. Uh, we don't close. Um, we have Category 3A and 3B capabilities, so we can land in virtually any um, weather capability. Um, we can facilitate passenger flights, emergency landings, Royal Mail, cargo and medical, uh, including transplants, PSNI, military. Um, so we are the safety net, essentially, for Northern Ireland and anybody over flying us. Unfortunately, we can't support these flights when we're closed. Um, and we've taken that decision not likely during November to close. If we don't get some support to sustain our business, um, and recover quickly, aviation in Northern Ireland would be pushed back more than 30 years. It would be hard for people to see their friends and family and do business in Britain. It will, it will become very difficult for us and as a country to actually move forward. Can I talk about the connectivity in 2019? Um, to put it into context, in 2019 we carried almost 6.3 million passengers to 70 domestic and international destinations. Last year, 70% of all passenger journeys out of Northern Ireland were out of BFS, 44,000 flights. And of those journeys, um, we carried 47% of the business traffic for Northern Ireland, so we're crucial to the business community as well. EasyJet, our largest carrier, actually carried 53% of all passengers out of Northern Ireland. Normally, we have six based aircraft with locally employed cockpit and cabin crew, together with Jet2, who have four based aircraft, again with locally employed cockpit and cabin crew. And we have associated jobs across the board. We, last year, we facilitated more than 5,000 time-sensitive cargo flights for Royal Mail, DHL, online retailers, and over 5,000 medical and private flights, and 2,000 PSNI and MOD flights in 2019. 2020. Since the arrival of COVID-19, passenger numbers have dropped significantly in line with global travel restrictions, and we regrettably had to close our passenger terminal, but stayed open at our own cost to facilitate the deliveries of food, medicines and PPE during the initial first lockdown, April through to June. During that lockdown period, we facilitated 3,000 flights, kept our airport open 24-7 to ensure medical emergencies could be facilitated. That cost the company upwards of £5 million, and we're still making substantial losses today and keeping ourselves open. Year to date, we've seen a 54% drop in flights, 70% drop in passenger numbers. So this year, only 1.6 million passengers have passed through the terminal up until the end of October. In the same period in 2019, 5.5 million went through the terminal. In fact, COVID has wiped out 35 years of growth. In June, we lost 98% of our passenger numbers compared with 2019. It just shows to show how significantly our sector has been affected. We've been subject to quarantine, fire breaks, circuit breaks, tiers, and a whole raft of other restrictions, 
and we can't continue to sustain that. By the start of 2020, we as BAE employed 200 direct staff and a further 5,000 people were employed on the site. Sadly, since then, we've lost 32 of our staff through a voluntary redundancy scheme, almost 20% of our workforce. And when sugar it, it was one of the hardest things I've had to do in my career, was losing friends and colleagues. So far on the site, we estimate there's been 800 job losses across security, ground handling, retail, um, airlines, etc. We've had to operate tactical closures through the night and through the day. That number could increase quite substantially unless support is forthcoming. We need your help to make sure that doesn't happen. Let's be clear, if the UK government had extended the flexi follows, we'd be in a much more difficult situation today. And we're using that furlough as are many other companies on the site to retain, retain and protect jobs for as long as possible. In terms of support to date, we've used the furlough schemes quite extensively, as have virtually every other company on the site, and received a rates holiday. For that, I thank me, uh, Minister Murphy and his team in the Department of Finance. It's been, it's been a godsend. But there are fixed costs associated with operating our business, which we just can't get rid of, and air traffic control, security, policing, utilities, and operational security costs, which we just cannot um, degrade or because we have to maintain our standards for our regulators, in the CAA and the Department for Transport. The Assembly, the Executive and specifically the Infrastructure Manager need to work together to ensure Northern Ireland gets the connectivity it deserves. When it comes clear that there's going to be disruption to air travel, I wrote to the Finance Minister on the 24th of March and asking for support, and again on the 19th of April. I followed up with Finance, Economy and Infrastructure Ministers repeating that request. We have heard and read that there's 10 million set aside for supporting airports, but to date we have received none of this money and we haven't heard from the department or the minister about this. This is why we're here today to ask your help. We've subsidized medical flights, NHS, cargo, carrying PPE, PSNI and MOD, and we've subsidized operations to make sure the people of Northern Ireland receive their online purchases. We can't continue to do this. We're asking for your help and support. I'd just like Emmanuel to, to conclude and then we're, I think, available for questions. Thank you very much, Graham. Good, good, good morning, Madam and, and Member Committee. Uh, thank you for, first of all, giving us this opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to speak to you the, the, this morning. I think, Graham, you, 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 you made a, a statement. Uh, ju just from, from, from my side, as the, the chairman of, of Belfast International and, and representative of Vinci Airport, uh, to highlight that uh, uh, this crisis uh, has, has been for the aviation sector and, and for us uh, a, a dramatic uh, a downturn. Uh, as you probably know, Vinci Airport uh, manage uh, 46 airports across the world, and, and especially in Europe. As you probably know, in UK, we're also managing London Gatwick, who has been suffering a lot, uh, same as, as Belfast. Just to let you know, in November, our overall traffic will be probably minus 80% compared to last year. Overall, the year will be more than minus 70%. Uh, we have seen, uh, and, and mostly due in Europe to drastic and UK drastic lockdown restriction, uh, this traffic uh, uh, having high difficulty to recover, and we don't see a, a proper recovery uh, before the end of 2021. We still have some hope for the uh, uh, summer next year, but uh, uh, carry on. Uh, the first uh, part of next year will be extremely difficult, um, and this is why uh, uh, being supported by the executive in Northern Ireland will be critical. Um, we felt, and I felt for the moment, to uh, uh, have meeting with Minister Malone. I understand the Department of Infrastructure and his team is is being responsible for uh, uh, providing such support. Uh, uh, again, we are very thankful for. Uh, uh, obtaining from the uh, 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 Minister of Finance uh, the uh, 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 rates uh, uh, support uh, uh, reduction. But I think we, as, as you could understand from Graham, we, we will need more uh, uh, to uh, reopen and, uh, and uh, uh, reoperate our airport uh, uh, as, as normal. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you both for, for your comments in, in uh, respect of this. Um, obviously, the Department of Infrastructure will be quite um, clear in its, its remit. 
um, and it is quite limited. Um, however, that aside, there has been an exceptional circumstances in around all of this, and they have been um, charged with um, looking after the, the, the support package. Um, I suppose what's quite interesting is the fact that there was an announcement made um, last week with regards to um, CODA and the £1.23 million pounds was allocated there in order to ensure uh, the, that it remained operational. Now, what you've highlighted really this morning is the fact that you're now in that place where there are challenges around your future. Um, Graeme, you have said sort of in the short term that there have been 800 jobs lost. In the longer term, what do you see the future for the airport um, if this is to continue um, for um, another few months? I, I think the thing is it, 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 it's going to be bleak. Um, it's difficult to gauge um, just what will happen. Um, the problem we face is that lockdowns, um, fire breaks, tears all create lack of confidence in travel. Um, it's difficult to gauge, but it will be serious. You know, if you look at it, we were the second largest and still are the second largest site employer in Northern Ireland. You know, that's 800 jobs already gone on the site and many more jobs at threat. Okay, and at this, at this point, if you had... Of course, passenger public needs mobility and, and we support the mobility uh, and, and uh, those lockdowns and restrictions and, and, and not being supported uh, might affect uh, of course, this uh, ability to, uh, to to airlines to provide mobility uh, as part of Belfast International Airport Company. Uh, for for the time being, uh, we only be able to uh, uh, reduce staff through voluntary plan. Yep. Uh, we hope to only continue on that direction. We we have no forced leave. Uh, we had no obligation, and we 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 kept as the shareholder and, and the company. Uh, within our own cost and supported within our own cost the, uh, uh, the burden of, uh, uh, of the uh, staff cost and uh, uh, just trying to save as much as we can. I'm not sure it will be able in the future if it continues like that. Okay, and, and you have actually made, um, you, ha you, have, you have written to the Minister and to the Department, have you? Yes, we have. And, have, um, what, and what response have you received to, to date on that? Um, essentially, we, we, there are there seems to be some meeting being organised between um, finance and economy with the Minister of Infrastructure, but we've not been contacted. I don't think there's been any date set. Um, the Minister seems to say she's accepted a meeting, but um, we've had no contact in terms of that. We've asked for meetings and we stand ready to do that, but no date given to us to, to talk. Okay. In, in response to a question that I, that I put to the Minister, um, she did say that the Department of Finance were leading on work for safety and security <coughs> measures and that was obviously for all three airports and that would be coming out of the remaining 8.8 .8 million pounds which has been held for airports has there been any discussion in relation to that um, and you know what would your ask be with regards to um, those particular measures um, you know we were contacted last night by the department of finance to further that and we're giving them information today hopefully that we can uh, our finance team are working on that um, but from the infrastructure team, um, no, no contact in terms of the of what they, of what they require. Okay, and um, I suppose really, I suppose the, the question really would be, what would your ask be then um, from um, this fund in order to um, allow you to remain operational? We've asked for a large seven-figure sum. Um, you know, our requirement in terms of operational cost is very high. Um, you know, we're working through that now. Um, you know, our, our losses are already in excess of £5 million pounds so far this year. Um, much of that is, is cash burn and, and our shareholders are allowing us to maintain that and keep operating. But it, it's not sustainable going forward. So I think from our perspective, we just, you know, we, we're working through those numbers um, and we'll be talking to the Department of Finance later today. Okay, and, and just finally for me, um, obviously you, are, you work it's, your work is much broader than just passenger uh, passengers. Um, you also have the medical flights as well. Um, what impact, if any, has the closure um, created on that? Um, we're, we're not aware of any individual um, circumstances because we've just announced the closure so nobody could operate, so nobody would ask to operate. Okay. So what, it's called a notice to airmen, no time, but we are now closed. 
So for the example, yesterday we closed at 10 o'clock till 6.30. So no aircraft were moving during that period. Okay. So if any medical flights have been requested, they were not operating from that. Okay, thank you. Mr Buchanan? Okay, thank you, uh, Graeme and Emmanuel. There's a couple of quick questions on just on running costs. I appreciate, Graeme, you fired out a few figures there. What was your running costs prior to the pandemic, you know, so let's say a year ago? Well, that's a yearly figure, weekly figure, daily figure. What's your roughly running costs? Roughly? Uh, rough running costs last year would have been around about the £30 million pound mark. Per okay. But that gives it, I mean, that's, I don't have the figures in front of me. No, no. Roughly. It would be in the annual accounts. Do you see when you refer to the, the airport closed and the airport open? Uh, what's the difference in financial terms? I appreciate whenever it's closed, I presume not everybody's gone. So what's the financial difference between it open and closed? What's the saving by having it closed? It, it's, saving, um, it's saving us um, a four or five figure sum during that period, but it's saving us money. What percentage are you talking between open and closed? It's not a huge amount in terms of percentage, but it's amount that we have to save. So is it, what, is it 20, 30 percent of a saving being closed? It's difficult, it's difficult to gauge that in terms of percentage terms. I can get back to you again. Okay. However, okay. it's a decision we have to make because we have no flights. There's no point in us being open if there are no flights. And whenever you are, whenever you are closed, I presume no flights can land from an emerging point of view? Have you any emergency no. cover whenever you're closed? No. Okay, so you're closed, you're closed. You can't close for, for an emergency yeah. landing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair. You're very welcome. Thanks very much for presenting to the committee. I just, just in terms of, of the immediate future and your projection for the sector, um, I mean, the Chair asked earlier on about your asks for how we can assist you. But just can you talk through exactly how we can assist for the immediate future um, and what's the challenge, the major challenge for you? I, I, I think the major challenge for us is confidence um, in getting people back flying. Um, you know, the sector itself is, is struggling. I think for us, it's, it's, it's survival mode, in which we are in survival mode, is, is to cover some of the operating costs that we have, much of which are fixed, whether it be air traffic control, policing, security, operational safety costs, which we cannot reduce because we have a high fixed cost operating base. It's buying time, um, you know, till we get some level of recovery. We're hoping next summer we might get us back into some level of, of traffic. But I think overall, I think Emmanuel has got a better grasp of me through Europe, is in Europe, they're not expecting true recovery until for, for several years. Right. We, we, yeah. Giving you an overall picture, we, and, and that's something we share also with the uh, institution and, and especially aviation institution. We do not expect uh, a proper recovery to 2019 uh, traffic for domestic traffic before 2022 2023 and on international traffic before 2024 uh, that that's what we expect in most of our airport and, and especially for belfast city belfast airport uh, international uh, indeed in terms of fixed cost of course today uh, running our fixed cost as as graham mentioned is, is uh, uh, we, we we have to face a, a, a period of time where we cannot generate revenues from our passenger while we have fixed costs. Closing the airport helps us to reduce those fixed costs, but we still have those costs. Um, and, and, and nevertheless, we, we expect to, uh, and we are forecasting a, a, a slab recovery uh, by middle of next year uh, in order to re-engage uh, our strategy, uh, our investment, and, and we have several investments that we would like to carry on and continue, and especially on the uh, expanding the airport and the uh, security building, expanding the commercial area uh, that, that we, we see in the future. Of course, we today we need to address this very short-term uh, situation, uh, mainly due because uh, the COVID is, 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 is more prolonged that, um, and, 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 and longer than what we, we expected at the beginning of the crisis. Right, thank you. And uh, obviously, we, we all welcome the announcement this morning about the, the vaccine and the potential for it. but. Just finally, I mean, I was then saying that you're looking at a financial package that will cover you for at least the next three or four months or six months, or because you said there, obviously the recovery plan for is, is longer period. So is is that the kind of financial package you're looking at? I think we are because you know we, you know we've um, through this COVID period, if you look at our estimates, you know we thought in April we'd get recovery by June, 
in May, we thought we'd get recovery in August. And our figures just get lower and lower and lower. I think we're on version nine or version 10 of our passenger projection for, for 2020. I think the difficulty we face is that we don't really know just when recovery will start to such a decent level. I think what we're looking at is potential support beyond March 2021 as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Anderson? Hello. Um, hello. Hi. Okay, that's me on mute. Um, Graham and Emmanuel, uh, thank you for that. And. I'm sure, like everyone in the room, nobody wants to pit one airport off another. And I represent the constituency of Derry, and it was very welcome news uh, for all of us as a, as representatives and for the people to hear that there was 1.23 million allocated there for operational costs. So I can understand, as a former MEP who regularly used both city and international airport, the importance of both of those airports uh, and all three airports, I have to say, for the All Ireland economy. So I'm trying just to tease out the ask. I hear you say that you have been requesting a meeting with the minister. I know uh, and I'm conscious of the comment that was made by the chair around the safety and security of all three airports and perhaps the, the remainder of the finances that were set aside going to that. But when the dairy announcement was made, when the 1.3 million was made for the allocation to dairy, I think that was on the 19th of November, Chair. And we were told then at that stage that urgent consideration was being given by the executive to support the Belfast and the international airports. So I think we need to um, ascertain what that means, what the urgent consideration means for international and for city, because Graeme, I'm conscious that at one stage you'd said it was costing 65,000 a day to accommodate medical and emergency flights just to leave the airport yeah. open in the event of needing that. And that's a cost, obviously, at this at this stage that you cannot continue uh, to allow um, to drain out of whatever reserves you may have left. And given what you said about the modelling, and you're on your ninth, uh, your 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 ninth sort of scheme of trying to project what's going to happen ahead with this virus, it's very hard to do that. So, it, Chair, I, I am struggling just to get a wee handle, Graham and Emmanuel, that what you're asking the committee today is it a to ask the minister to meet with you so that um, because I know you have put in that request, um, and given that we know that there are other ministers responsible, whether it's for tourism and here around safety and security, the finance minister, but the specific ask that you have in for the infrastructure minister, I'm assuming she would uh, she would meet you uh, to hear what you had to say and also to report what the urgent consideration was given. And then when you work out the figures, Graham, because we need to know what is the figure. I mean, we can't just say, will you give them something? Uh, it would be good for us when you do finally calculate that figure for us to know exactly what is the financial support that you're seeking. Um, maybe I, maybe you said that and I, and I didn't pick that up, so that we could also um, at least inform the minister, um, and Mr. Simmons would know anyway, but that this is what they asked is from the International Airport. And you know, I think originally we were asked by Minister Murphy's team to put in a, a in, you know, safety and security costs, and that was in excess of £12 million pounds for a period um, which was asked. Um, I think for us, the, 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 you know, we know there's a pot of 8.8 .8 million left after, after CODA's share. I think we would be looking for a, you know, a large chunk of that. We're not going to try to be greedy. We're just trying to be sensible in terms of, of our ask. And I think for us, we just got to make sure that it, it keeps us survival mode. Um, you know the, the three airports in Northern Ireland are all vital in their various ways, and but you know we are the largest. We're the one that supports a range of products. We're the one that keeps this place moving in terms of cargo, in terms of our passenger numbers, but also in terms of our jobs. You know we have jobs from every, people come here from every constituency in Northern Ireland, from you know from as far away as Foyle. Um, we have guys travelling. Would you believe from Donegal? To come and work at the airport, and pilots coming up from from the Republic to fly from here. So, and I think this is where we need that support to be able to, to continue to provide those jobs. Um, I think yes, we'd like to meet with the minister. 
And I think that's a key one, um, is to try and build that relationship because we are a key part of the infrastructure of Northern Ireland. And I think Emmanuel and I want to work with that. And, we want, and then as Emmanuel stated, we want to invest here, but the money we're currently burning is the money that was set aside to invest. And you know those are the sort of things that we'll not be able to do. Well, I think listening to, um, sorry, Emmanuel, I cut across you there, but just listening to not just people here on the committee, but also on the floor of the assembly, I think there's support for all of the airports uh, on the on the island and on the, here in the north of Ireland. So I think we need to make sure that whatever that asked is, that the minister is hearing directly from yourselves. Um, because I think if she was to sit down and listen to yourself, I'm not saying she doesn't have that understanding, but I think a face-to-face -face meeting or a Zoom meeting, whatever it would necessitate uh, during this climate, would be most helpful for yourselves. But from our point of view, from Sinn Féin's point of view, uh, we would support the airports um, getting the kind of support. Obviously, it's going to depend on the ask, Graham, and you can work, that needs worked out, but um, all three airports to keep them operational needs to be supported. Sorry, Michael. Thank you very much, Martina. It's exactly what we we, we asked. Uh, actually, uh, Befa City obtained some uh, support uh, last summer at, during the first lockdown. Coda uh, now is, is getting support. So, uh, as you exactly mentioned, the three airports uh, have, have uh, are necessary for the uh, Northern Ireland and, and addressing also different market, different destination. Uh, we with EasyJet, uh, we are linking. Uh, a different destination uh, and, and especially international destination in addition to the medical flight, the, the mail, etc. And uh, we we would like to uh, to be able to meet with the minister and, and, and we know that there are some support. I'm very pleased that the uh, Ministry of Finance is asking us for cost. We'll be able to provide and, and, and see how can we we get some, some discussion and see what we can obtain. But, uh, definitely this is what we are asking today. Well, I mean, we would lend our support to maybe a letter going from the committee to the minister, if, if the chair so wishes, to take that forward to ask the minister to meet with yourselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hildage, Deputy Chairman. Thanks, and you're very welcome this morning. Uh, Graham, obviously, there, there is a crisis there, and uh, it, has to be, it has to be worked through. It's absolutely crucial that the, the airports uh, remain operational as best we can during this period. Uh, you touched upon some of the sort of more commercial end of things, cargo. Is, is there much business going through the airport as far as cargo goes compared to the passenger flights? Is... But, you know, we have, you know, we're, the, we're quite a large cargo airport at night, so it's all integrated traffic. So, for example, every one of your online purchases is probably coming through us. Um, we have the Royal Mail, so the Royal Mail had two flights a night. Um, but bear in mind that the passenger operation previously subsidised the cargo operation um, because you know it's, it is a very it's through the night it is um, not as busy in terms of flight movements but we've kept the Royal Mail operating we've been talking to Royal Mail about moving flights to look at um, closing during the night uh, so we're still in talks with Royal Mail um, but it, it gives you some indication of. Um, how crucial we are to Northern Ireland in terms of that. We now have test kits coming in um, to Randolph's from, uh, from England on Freitas. We have PPE coming in, so and foodstuffs going out. So a lot of our exports go out, high value exports go out on our Freitas at night. Yeah. Now I'm just trying to tease out how, how important that, that element to the operation is, uh, particularly when you're going they're going to support, you know. In, in terms of the business, it is it is a tiny part of the business. It's about it's it's about seven or eight percent of our revenue is cargo. Um, so in terms of that, it is not massive. Uh, you know, the a, a box doesn't buy a coffee, park a car, or um, spend money in the duty free and like a passenger. You, you mentioned you had subsidised the uh, some aspects of the operation that, that you were. What sort of what way was that subsidised by paying people on site to work through the shifts or well, you know what, what we, our subsidy basically is if we close completely and sent everybody home and shut down we would save ourselves money but we've kept operating by keeping it open so for example during the lockdown 
we kept enough fire crew and operational cover to operate medical, police, military flights. So we, are, so we kept open during that period. So it's the same with cargo at night. You know, we have a full fire cover. We have everything ready to go, full air to air, to air traffic control cover. So that, that cost is enormous and the cost outweighs the revenue. And that was for the, the greater benefit of the people of Northern Ireland. So yeah. th thank, thank you for your, your presentation. It's very supportive indeed, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just two questions. Um, in relation to the closures that you're having to do because of the financial situation you find yourself in, um, obviously you're, you're, you're closed. Uh, if there's medical emergency flights, what's the situation in relation to that? They have to wait till you reopen? Yes. That's a very serious situation that needs to be resolved because um, how often would you have had those medical emergency flights? It's difficult to gauge, but we handle probably several thousand medical flights a year. And are they currently going to George Best Belfast City Airport? Or? Uh, we don't know where they're going. Uh, okay. Or if they're operating. So in terms of the financial support that was issued in the first round, um, you're aware that um, Belfast City and City of Derry got financial support and you yourselves didn't get any support. Could you give us maybe a bit of a background to how that occurred uh, and uh, what your understanding was around that? Um, we believe that there was used was lifeline services for Coda and for Belfast City. Um, you know, we were still operating, so we requested support but didn't get any. Okay. And has there been any proactive engagement by any of the government departments with yourselves about supporting this round? Uh, and the, the Department for Finance have been very proactive. I think it would be very fair to say, and to some extent, the Department for Economy um, as well. Okay. And what about the Department of Transport in London? Uh, no contact at all. Okay. Have they offered any support to any other airports across the UK? I'm, as far as I'm aware, other than, other than the support offered to Belfast City and Coda, nothing, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very well, much. I can, I, I can mention that the, for instance, Gafu doesn't receive any specific uh, support from the FD in London. Okay. Um, well, thanks, thanks very much, and thank you, Emmanuel and uh, Graham. Um, could I just check? Um, it was our understanding that there was rates relief provided to the airport of 1.7 million. Is, uh, is that correct? We had a rates holiday. Yeah. Alongside the other two airports, which um, which I addressed, which I, we thanked um, Minister Murphy for. And, and we've been uh, given to understand the Department of Finance has two million pounds secured for safety and security measures. I just wonder, would that then uh, assist with your fixed costs around uh, traffic control, security? And you also mentioned airport police. Are you responsible for paying airport police, or does that come out of government? Yes. That's our, it's our own police force. Um, yes, we, we cover police. We're the only airport in Northern Ireland who cover policing costs. All oh, right. Uh, and what, what's it, why, why is that? It's, uh, it's something that's always been done at Belfast International. Um, the other two airports don't pay policing costs, yet we do. Okay, well, maybe we could ask why there's that anomaly. But mm. I, I just wondered then, uh, were, were, are there any. Um, Bespoke measures that have been implemented in other regional airports in GB that you think might be of assistance to yourselves? As far as I'm aware, not nothing that I know of. Um, but I suspect much of it. You know, it, I believe there's some borrowing being allowed in Liverpool by the mayor, um, perhaps in Luton. But beyond that, no specific package. So neither the Department of Transport nor. The regional airports has actually come up with any brilliant scheme, in essence, to no. assist airports, really? Um, as far as I'm aware, no, but... That's very disappointing. Mm -hmm. but, but I understand there's an outstanding commitment from three of the ministers to meet with yourselves, but you haven't got a date for that yet. There must no. be a, No, OK. Maybe. We met with um, Minister Dodds on Monday. Yeah. And, um, but I've had no contact, contact from the DOF last night from from a couple of very senior civil servants, including the permanent secretary, um, but nothing from the Department for Infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr Beggs. Again, thanks for your, your information. It's useful to have it. Uh, and I'm trying to understand how funding has been distributed. Uh, all three airports have been giving rates holidays, as uh, you've indicated. 
Uh, but two airports have been picked out for specific funding from the Department of Infrastructure, the, part, the Belfast City Airport, and the Derry City Airport. So my understanding is, um, have you any understanding why they received it and you did not? Has there been criteria set? Or, or why have you not received any funding, uh, given that you're running at a loss just like, like they were? I, I believe the initial payment to the two airports was under a lifeline services. Our, our main carrier, EasyJet and, and Ryanair and Jet2 had all stopped operations during the first lockdown. And I think it was last man standing. Um, I, you know, beyond that, I don't know the criteria. Um, it was based on cost, and I think there was a contract between the Department for Infrastructure and Belfast City uh, with regards to that. So, uh, sorry, can you just uh, expand a little bit more? What, what is Lifeline Services? I haven't come across it before. I, I, I assume that's just basically the last flights left going from Northern Ireland to London. There was one carrier left, which I believe was Aer Lingus, operating um, Belfast City. To during, the first, during the first lockdown. During the first uh, lockdown. Aer Lingus was the last carrier to provide uh, service uh, to uh, uh, London. And, and uh, that was the, uh, the reason uh, given to us uh, for supporting uh, Belfast City. But uh, at that time, EasyJet who is, of course, uh, providing and still providing uh, this time uh, uh, services to London uh, and different airports uh, uh, as, as stopped, but they were ready and they were not asked to, co to, to continue. And, uh, and, 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 and besides for, for this, we uh, actually uh, uh, filed complaints uh, for distortion of competition uh, at, at that time during the first lockdown, because uh, we could have, uh, of course, uh, uh, pushed uh, EasyJet to continue the service as well. Okay, okay. And, and I'm just thinking, in, in terms of your, your current operation, um, can you just clarify, are you breaking even or continue to lose money even with closure during the day? Uh, we're continuing to lose money. Okay, so... We had, um, during this period, um, from EasyJet, three flights a week to Liverpool. Normally we have eight a day. Four flights a week to Birmingham. Normally we have upwards of five a day. Four a week to London Gatwick. Normally we have upwards of eight a day. Uh, four a week to Bristol. Normally we have four a day. And four a week to Glasgow, when often we have up to six a day on Glasgow. Okay, thank so you. That's some indication of the difference. Okay, thank you. Graham, could I ask um, how other um, what the level of support for other airports is regionally? Mm. Um, in, in the Irish Republic, they've announced 80 million euros up until the end of March for their airports. Um, in the rest of the UK, I'm not sure what's happening in Scotland. In England, they've just announced a rates package of up to eight million pounds per airport. I think you know for most airports, the smaller ones that will be on the rates will be given back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but for the big ones, you know their rate builds are multiples of that. For example, Heathrow and Gatwick. Um, there has been some loans, I believe, organised by regional governments in terms of mayors, etc. I think Liverpool. Um, but beyond that, no real support. Okay, so there is. A, has there has there been a, a level of support which is focused? primarily on operational costs or has it really just been around rates and um, loans? It's, there, there has been, I believe, some support for policing costs um, in terms of that and I think the airports have been talking to their, their, their local police authorities and that in, in regards to that. We are very unusual in that we have our own police force. Um, so there has been some talks and I, and I believe the various um, local authorities are talking directly to the airports but nothing that I know is concrete or being announced. Okay, well, that, that's interesting. Look, um, can I thank both of you um, very Sorry, much? Sorry, Chair, can I just I mean, it's my understanding that uh, Minister Mallon has actually written to uh, Graham and they've actually responded. To, you know, I, I understood that there was an agreed meeting to, you know, the, the date just to be set. Just want to clarify that? Um, sorry, this, you just said I've accepted a meeting. I've got a oh, letter. There's no date, no phone uh, call, no dates. Organized. I was probably trying to get the three ministers at the one meeting. Probably the mm. 
Okay. Can I thank both of you for attending this morning? Um, obviously, these are very difficult circumstances that you find yourselves in, um, and certainly there is there there is a level of support um, around um, the assembly for um, for the airports, and uh, and we'll follow up with this um, in due course. So, thank you very much for attending this morning. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. That um, I suppose we're just as a follow up from that. Our, our next steps. Are you content that um, we contact um, the minister? Um, bearing in mind what we've we've heard this morning, I, and I'm, I'm guessing that none of this will be be new to her. Um, but at the same time, I suppose it's really just encouraging um, an urgent dialogue with with the airport um, because they are in really in very difficult situation. I don't think that was the case in the first lockdown. You know, uh, sorry, it seems to be the second lockdown has had a greater financial impact because uh, I think at one time they were fairly secure. You know, in the first lockdown, it seems to be the second one has really ripped it out. Well, that and also yeah. I think probably confidence because the yeah. number of people yeah. who are That's willing to go on holiday. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, it's 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 snowballed essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so members content that we do that. Okay. Shift on. Thank you very much. Then moving on to our next briefing, it's departmental briefing on flood management plans, um, and that also includes reservoirs. If you'll you'll find the briefing paper at page um, two hundred and twenty-three. Again, Hans Sard will record the meeting, um, and we'll welcome Jonathan McKay, Director of Rivers, Department of Infrastructure. Damien Curran, the Acting Director of Water and Drainage Police, uh, Policy Division at the department and Mark Strong, the head of flooding and drainage policy. The three of you are very welcome to committee this morning. Um, if you would like to um, start off and um, give a, a, a briefing, a brief um, overview and members will follow up with some questions. Indeed. Uh, good morning, Chair and members. Uh, thank you for inviting us to present some of the detail on the department's work in developing and implementing the flood risk management plans. I would also like to present some of the issues and the proposed next steps in relation to reservoir safety and flood risk. In, in broad terms, Damien heads up our water policy division. And he'll uh, begin by giving you an overview of how the flood risk management plans have been developed and then some of the legislative issues in relation to reservoirs. I will then follow up with an overview of the department's operational management of flood risk of the flood risk management plans and some of our ongoing reservoir related work from an operational perspective. So if, if everyone's agreeable, I'll, I'll pass the work out to Damien. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just as um, Jonathan described, I'd like to give the, the committee uh, really some further context in terms of policy and legislation uh, in relation to uh, the flood risk management plans and um, uh, the Reservoirs Act, uh, for which the department will soon be taking statutory responsibility of this. Um, so, turning first to flood risk management plans, um, and in terms of the next cycle of these plans, um, uh, the requirement for the plans is, is within the, the Floods Directive, um, which the committee will be aware it's uh, our European directive, which is to provide a, a consistent approach to the assessment and management of, of flood risks. Uh, and the requirements of the directive are enshrined in law here uh, by the Water Environment and Floods Directive Regulations in Northern Ireland 2009. Um, flooding can have devastating impacts, um, so really protecting the needs of the community is at the heart of the Floods Directive approach. Uh, it aims to manage and mitigate uh, the potential adverse consequences that flooding may have on, on elements of society, uh, including human health, the environment, cultural heritage and economic activity. Uh, and the department's the, the competent authority for implementing the directive uh, in Northern Ireland in partnership with a number of other statutory bodies, uh, including Northern Ireland Water and local councils. Uh, there's three stages uh, to the implementation of the floods directive. Uh, the first stage is the, the completion of the flood risk assessment. Uh, and that's the, the Northern Ireland flood risk, flood risk assessment, uh, 2018. Uh, and that has assessed the areas to be uh, of greatest risk. And then these areas are identified as areas of potential significant flood risk. 
Uh, the second stage then is preparation of flood hazard and flood risk maps uh, for the, these areas. And then the third stage is the preparation of the flood risk management plan. Uh, and this uh, includes objectives and measures uh, to manage potential flood risk uh, in each of those uh, uh, areas. Um, so in terms of the Northern Ireland Flood Risk Assessment, um, that's a, it's a technical report. Uh, it was published as I said, in December 2018, uh, and it's a high-level analysis of the, the potential economic, social and environmental impacts which could result uh, from flooding in Northern Ireland. Uh, it included a review of uh, something called the Preliminary Flood Risk Assessment uh, in 2011, uh, and it uses AFI's flood maps uh, to identify what areas are potentially at risk of uh, fluvial or, or river, uh, coastal and alluvial or surface water flooding. Uh, uh, and these assessments are carried out on a six-year cycle, uh, which allows for the inclusion of, of new and improved information. Uh, so this next uh, cycle, this six-year cycle of the flood risk management plan, this will cover the period 2021 20, to 27. Uh, and the draft flood risk management plan uh, is due to be issued for a six month consultation from the 22nd of December uh, with the publication of the final flood risk management plan by the 22nd of December uh, 2021. Uh, so a year process of consultation, review and finalisation of the plan. Um, the flood risk management plan will highlight uh, the flood hazards in, in, the, in these areas of potential significant flood risk in Northern Ireland. Uh, and the plan will identify the objectives and measures that will be undertaken to manage the risk of flooding and sets out how the relevant authorities will then work together with the communities to manage these flood risks. Uh, and this will follow the three P's approach of prevention, protection and preparedness. Uh, and Jonathan will go on just to expand on the, the practical application of this later on. Um, the flood risk management planning process will help the department and others to understand the potential impacts of flooding and inform where measures to to manage flood risk will provide most, most benefit. And there's much data uh, analysis and reporting involved in the process of delivering these plans and in meeting the terms of the floods directive. Uh, I just want to give the, the committee an overview of, of, of the, the consultation process as well, because that's a, an important step really in shaping uh, the management of flood risk throughout Northern Ireland over the six year life cycle of the plan. Uh, uh, the consultation will give organizations and individuals the opportunity to influence the plan. Uh, and really, it's important for the department as well just to take on board any of those ideas and, and comments that uh, they might have. Uh, it's a public consultation uh, that's, to, that's required by the legislation. Uh, and really, through it, we hope um, uh, to engage with all interested parties and, and particularly um, uh, those uh, communities that are affected uh, by flooding. Um, I also just want to give a, a sense of the scale of uh, flood risk in, in Northern Ireland. Um, our data shows that approximately um, 45,000 uh, or 5% 5 of the 861,000 properties in Northern Ireland are located in areas which are at risk from flooding uh, during an event that has a, a medium probability of occurring. And I'll go on to explain medium probability. Um, I just want to also compare, compare that stat with, uh, uh, with England. Uh, in England, there's about 5.2 million properties. Uh, or one in six properties um, which are at risk of flooding. So that's that's over 16%. Uh, so just to give a wee bit of context there. And in terms of um, medium probability event, um, uh, the, the probability of, of river flooding is, is described as a, a one in 100 year event, uh, coastal one in 200 year, uh, and surface water is, is also one in 200 year. Uh, in terms of analysis on economic costs of, of flooding, um, naturally enough, these can be significant. Um, a flooding occurred simultaneously in all the areas predicted to be at risk of a rivers, coastal and surface water flooding, um, as identified in the, uh, in the North Ireland Flood Risk Assessment. Um, the estimate of the average economic damages is, is 56 million in a given year. And uh, that's not to say there's, there's potential and measurable social harm and, and, and damage to, to, to how people live as well. Um, so it's, it's, it is significant. Uh, and in terms of the flood risk management plans, I just want to finish off this part of it by uh, referring to climate change. And there's, there's information in terms of climate change and how that's been uh, considered in the briefing. Uh, just to rehearse that, uh, climate change is, is considered, uh, has to be considered in the development of our, of our flood risk management plans. 
uh, and in February 2019, the, the department introduced uh, new technical flood risk guidance in relation to allowances for, for climate change. And that guidance is now used by, by officials to inform allowances uh, to be made for climate change in the design of flood alleviation and drainage infrastructure schemes. Uh, and the guidance is forward looking, looking forward to uh, the end of this century uh, in terms of allowances to be applied in relation for potential increases in river flood flows, sea level rise and surface water flooding due to higher rainfall intensities. Um, so I'd like us to now take the, the committee on to um, another piece of legislation in relation to the Reservoirs Act, Northern Ireland uh, 2015. Uh, and really just give a brief overview in terms of uh, um, the purpose and, and commencement of that, that act. Um, so the core purpose of the act is, is to provide powers for the regulation of reservoir safety in Northern Ireland. Uh, it will introduce a proportionate regulatory framework for the management and maintenance of reservoirs capable of holding 10,000 cubic metres or more of water above the natural level of the surrounding land. Uh, and they're defined as controlled reservoirs. Uh, so in terms of scale and context, um, there's considered to be around, at the minute, 179 controlled reservoirs in Northern Ireland. Um, however, that number uh, may change, may vary as the, the process of registering uh, these rev reservoirs commences under the, the Act. Uh, so in terms of who owns uh, these 179 reservoirs at present, uh, currently 89 of them are, are owned by Northern Ireland Water. Uh, there's 29 of them uh, owned by other public sector organisations. Um, there's 48 in the private sector uh, and there's 30, sorry, 13 in, in, in the not-for-profit uh, sector. Uh, and it's estimated that 83,000 people uh, live in the inundation zone uh, of, of these uh, reservoirs. Uh, to give further context in terms of the capacity of reservoirs and, and, and the threshold for this capacity, um, this uh, 10,000 cubic metres capacity volume threshold was set uh, by reservoir engineers. It's generally considered to be the volume above which if there was an uncontrolled release of water as a result of dam failure, that would have the potential to result in loss of life uh, and or significant damage to property and the environment. So the purpose of the Act really is a response to this risk. Um, and uh, it it's, it's to introduce a management regime to, to protect people, to protect this risk, uh, the environment, the economy and uh, cultural heritage from harm due, due to the dam failure. Um, so who's going to be, be held responsible under the Act? Um, well, it provides, the Act provides that a reservoir manager is responsible for reservoir safety. And generally, the reservoir manager is a person who manages or operates the reservoir. If no one manages or operates the reservoir, then by default, it's the reservoir owner who is a reservoir uh, manager. Uh, the department's identified most of the reservoir managers um, of the reservoirs that fall within the scope of the Act. However, we need the implementation of the reservoir owner registration process before we have full visibility of this. So just to bring you on to the commencement of the Act and, and how that's intended to, to, to run, so um, the committee might be aware that statutory responsibility of the Act still remains at this point in time with DARE. Uh, um, the Act had been left out of the, the Department's Transfer of Function Order 2016, at the restructure of the departments then. Um, but this year, her minister has uh, had written to the DARE minister, agree, agreeing to the transfer of the Act um, to, to, to the Department. Uh, and the Executive Office is currently processing a transfer of functions order through the Assembly. Um, this process was expected to complete by mid-December, uh, but the latest information just as, as of yesterday is that it's now likely to be early in the new year. Um, but following um, the completion of this, uh, this process, uh, and in terms of the commencement of the Act, uh, our Minister will now uh, will consider the introduction of the orders and regulations required to implement the key reservoir safety regime provided by the Act and based on industry best practice for the management and maintenance of, uh, of the reservoirs. And, and just to give the committee, a, I guess, a flavour of, of what the safety regime means, um, the, the system will include following elements such as uh, registration. That's really the first stage in the, in the process, compelling reservoir managers to, to register the reservoirs. Uh, second, after that, there'll be a, a process of designation where the department Following the registration, we'll give the controlled reservoir uh, a de designation of either high consequence, medium consequence, or low consequence. Um, there'll need to be regulations around supervision. 
uh, where the reservoir, reservoir is designated as high or medium, they must be supervised by a supervising engineer. Uh, and then there'll be this, the inspection stage where uh, those high and medium consequence reservoirs will be inspected by an inspecting engineer and an inspecting report will be provided to the reservoir manager and the department identifying uh, those measures required uh, in the interests of safety. Uh, and that's, that's going to be a, sort of the key report here, the measures required in the interests of safety, because the reservoir manager must undertake these, uh, these safety actions uh, as directed under the supervision of the inspecting engineer. Uh, uh, and then the, the inspecting engineer will provide uh, the necessary certificates to um, confirm completion of that, um, that process. Um, the department is also establishing a panel of reservoir engineers uh, and appoint engineers to to these panels as recommended, and these will be you know suitably skilled recommended uh, engineers qualified uh, by the institution of civil engineers. Uh, there'll be uh, this, this is a big piece of legislation. There will be uh, other uh, associated sections and regulations uh, required to assist reservoir managers in complying with or implementing the management regime. Uh, just for. A, Example um, information will be provided in relation to registration, dispute referral process, uh, forms and con contents of notices, certificates, reports, emergency response information. Uh, these all require regulations to be made. Uh, the designation of the reservoir is high, medium, and low. That's an important step as well because that then determines the level of regulation and management required, as I described in the process, uh, with most focus on, on high and medium consequence. Uh, and the criteria for designating a reservoir is based on the potential for adverse consequences from the, the, the uncontrolled release of, of water on human health and life. Naturally, uh, any reservoir with the potential for an adverse risk on human life will be designated high uh, and will require the appropriate level of scrutiny and oversight. And then I just want to finish off um, my part um, by referencing the uh, financial assistance and, and, and grant making powers, uh, which is a part uh, uh, within the Reservoirs Act. Uh, it provides a power to bring uh, such grant making powers forward by regulation. Uh, our minister is minded to give consideration to uh, a grant scheme for reservoir managers. Uh, this will require a number of considerations. Um, really, for example, it might be a time bound capital grant in which the, the department pays a contribution of capital costs, safety related work uh, on reservoirs. Uh, but we're in the process of working through uh, an appropriate business case. Uh, we'll need consideration of available funding. Uh, we need to look at the options and we need to get um, proper you know, consultation and, and analysis and support for that. Um, Chair, I'd just like to hand back to, to Jonathan now. Thank you for your, your time. Thank you, Damien. Uh, so Damien has outlined the, the work that the department's taken forward to develop new flood risk management plans, but there's an existing suite of flood risk management plans that cover the period from 2015 to 2021. And they outline really all aspects of flood risk management, focusing on three main themes or three main pillars, if you like, that underpin um, our flood risk management work. And they are prevention, protection, and preparedness. So in terms of prevention, that's really our work in advising planning authorities in relation to development proposals that are being considered. And the key objective there is to avoid development in known areas of flood risk. Planning and flood risk policy here is recognized as, as very robust. And it's one of the reasons why there are fewer properties here in known areas of flood risk than there are in, for example, England. And this is an area of work that has grown in recent years. There's been an approximate increase of between two and three hundred percent in the number of planning consultations that we deal with since 2011. Um, however, it's very important work because to avoid development in known areas of flood risk not only reduces the flood risk, but it also reduces the need for flood alleviation infrastructure. In order to improve our performance in responding to planning consultations at the end of last year, we augmented our planning team in rivers and we're seeing a significant improvement in consultation response timeliness. However, a further increase in planning consultations could adversely impact uh, performance again. An increase in consultation numbers is possible as we move towards using climate change flood maps 
as opposed to present day flood maps for development management and climate change floodplains are included in the council's local development plans. The next of the, of the, the, the three main pillars that underpin our work is the, the theme of protection. And really at the heart of that is the development of flood alleviation schemes and the maintenance of our drainage infrastructure. To give a sense of scale, we have 70 projects approximately on our capital works program. And that would require about 130 million investment if all of those projects were taken forward simultaneously. One of the largest schemes that we're working on is the Belfast Tidal Flood Alleviation Scheme. And it's estimated that that scheme would protect about 1,500 properties from coastal flood risk. And it's estimated to cost about 18 million. It's hoped um, that that scheme would be on site in the summer of 2021. Other areas where significant projects are being developed include Newry, Portadown, Drumahoe, Eglinton and Derry, and, that, and that's just a few. There are many other locations on, on our Capital Works programme. Uh, the Newcastle Flood Alleviation Scheme is also due to go to tender in the near future. And as the Minister has asked us to do, we're doing all that we can to accelerate the delivery of that project. We also undertake a significant amount of, of maintenance on our water courses and our flood defences. And this year we plan to undertake approximately six kilometres of repairs to culverts, sea defences and, and fluvial defences uh, or river related defences. Uh, and then in addition to this, we, we would inspect and maintain as necessary around 900 urban water courses and 350 rural water courses. The third main pillar in the management of flood risk here is, is the theme of preparedness and that inclu includes our own operational emergency response which involves our, our own direct labour force um, and we're fortunate that we have our own staff that can carry this out. They understand the importance of emergency response, they understand where our critical infrastructure is and can respond in a very timely way but as we all know um, flooding events can be of such a scale that it can overwhelm the resources of the department and therefore we have a very important role in fulfilling uh, the role of lead government department which means that we provide the expertise that allows all of the other response organizations to respond in a cohesive way and to make best use of the combined resources of government to help those in, in times of emergency. We also have uh, in conjunction with local government uh, led a regional programme of community engagement and that's to help local communities develop their resilience in areas of known flood risk and there are over 31 areas where that uh, approach has been used very successfully and this work is de developed um, very well in recent years as well recognised both here um, and in England, Scotland and Wales has been a good example of, of how to undertake this community engagement type of work and we are using our relatively small regional sized advantage. One of the novel approaches that we've developed in recent times to manage flood risk here is the Homeowner Flood Protection Grant Scheme. And the aim of that scheme is to encourage the owners of residential properties to modify their property to make them more resistant to flooding. We've undertaken a project evaluation and that has demonstrated that the scheme does provide value for money and there's both a need for and a benefit from a property level protection grant scheme. The scheme continues while we consider what the next step should be and what should be included in any substantive scheme that, that the Minister may wish to take forward. So in terms of some other operational responsibilities that we've had to, to take forward in recent times, uh, safety issues in the absence of the full commencement of the Reservoir Act is an area that we've been focusing on. And as part of this, in the interest of public safety, we have written to the managers of some reservoirs, most recently in May of this year, to remind them of their common responsibility to ensure the reservoir is in a safe condition. Um, at present, urgent interventions are required at at least nine reservoirs, and the department has engaged with the managers, managers of these reservoirs um, where that's possible in relation to the engineers' recommendations that need to be taken forward. Um, however, not all managers have responded positively and, and issues remain and there is most definitely a need for the commencement of the, the Reservoirs Act, the full commencement of that Act. 
I, I know that planning and reservoir issues is an area that concerns some members and, and rightly so. And planning policy here does include Absolutely. for the effective management of development in the inundation areas of controlled reservoirs. But a developer must demonstrate that the condition management and maintenance regime of the reservoir is appropriate to allow the development to, to proceed. In order to be as pragmatic and helpful as possible, we work closely with local planning authorities and other officials in the department to develop short-term approaches. Uh, and one of these is the development of, of a process known as the responsible reservoir manager status. And that allows reservoir managers to voluntarily comply with the provisions that would have been envisaged in the Act or, and are envisaged in the Act. And, and if they were to attain that status for their reservoir, that would allow a positive planning consultation response. Okay. As we look into the future, the, there will always be future flood risk management challenges, regardless of how much we do and how well we do it. And, and one of those challenges, perhaps the biggest of all, is extreme rainfall events, a large amount of rainfall falling over a short period of time. And that's still a key area of concern, not just here, but in many other countries. And the exact locations of heavy, thundery downpours, such as those that were experienced in the Northwest in August 2017 and in Newcastle just this year, they're very difficult to predict. Forecasting of this weather, it, it tests the abilities of the world's best forecasters and the extremely complex forecasting models that, that are available to them. And therefore, a risk still remains that a very severe weather incident could overwhelm the capacity of infrastructure and indeed the combined resources of government organisations to respond to, to such an emergency. Nevertheless, we continue to do all that we can to reduce the risk here, and we use to, to the maximum benefit the variety of approaches and, and measures that I have that I've mentioned earlier. So thank you very much for allowing us to outline some of our work. Okay, thank you, and thank you for that very, very detailed briefing. Um, it's very much appreciated. Um, sure, just before you start, just in case, um, I have family members who work within the Rivers Agency. So to, just that to clarify that as an interesting Questions to you. I better just put that on record. I don't think, just in case. No, your interest is, is declared. Well, just put it down, relatives, no names. Used to call them ministry men. Uh, okay. Call them ministry men back in the day, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank, thank yes, you. Cheers, um, now I've lost the run. <laughs> Okay, um, Just ask so, what the standard of the workforce is, but then... <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just remind members, actually, that we um, need to leave this room by, by midday. Um, so, um, uh, just going back to this, thank you very much. Um, you've obviously mentioned um, a number of flood alleviation schemes, which are, are in the process of being... Um, various stages of, of moving towards commencement and we've all seen the devastation of flash flooding um, quite recently as well in, in, in the Newcastle area. Um, in the, Be the Belfast Tidal Scheme is probably the one which is probably closest to commencement. Um, your anticipated um, commencement date of spring um, next year. How long will that project take? The project will take at least a year. Uh, the logistics of the contractor have to undertake and then once it commences on site it will take at least at least a year or two to develop that scheme. Okay and, and, the, and the other schemes which, which you'd refer to obviously um, in Newcastle being one of them, when, when is that anticipated to start? Newcastle's programme to commence on site in the summer of next year but uh, as I mentioned the Minister has asked us to accelerate the scheme as much as possible. It's, it's due to go out to tender um, in the very near future. Um, and we're, we're looking at how we can reduce not only the, the amount of time to get it onto site, but then also the, the amount of time that it would, would take on site to, to develop that scheme as well. Okay, you, you referenced the, the homeowner flood protection grant scheme and the, the fact that you've seen that to be um, value for money and, and the benefits that flow from it. Although um, homeowners are only encouraged to take part, what are the barriers to them um, actually participating in that scheme? Know all about it. <laughs> Well, we, we, we have publicised the scheme through a number of, of channels, uh, including our, our engagement with communities at known flood risk. So we have made a significant number of people aware of the scheme. 
some home, homeowners have felt that their 10% contribution to the scheme was prohibitively high. Uh, and then another feature of the scheme is that if the protection measures around the property cost in excess of 10,000, the homeowner has to pay the full cost of that, ex of that excess above 10,000. So in a number of cases that has also been a, a limiting factor. Where, where homeowners have availed of the scheme, the general consensus has been that it has been worthwhile, for, particularly to give them peace of mind should future flooding occur again, that their home is protected to a greater level than would have, would have been without the grand scheme. Okay, and, and if homeowners do um, take up the scheme, is there a benefit to them with regards to their insurance costs? It, it, it's not unilaterally accepted by the insurance industry that if they have, you know, at the end of the homeowner grant scheme, that they will have a lower premium. But it's certainly information that they should pass through to their insurance company, and it may be that particular insurers may take that into account in, in, in reducing their, their premium. As well as that, homeowners can also avail of, of a product called Flood Re, which is available here, which has been developed to allow homeowners to access uh, home insurance if they live in a flood risk area more readily and, and on a more affordable basis. And we work very closely with DEFRA in England to make sure that that scheme was applicable here. And there has been actually uh, quite a few insurance policies here that have availed of that okay, since and the scheme was and, and could you provide the committee with inf some more information in relation to that scheme and, and the uptake of it? In, in relation to the, the grant the, scheme? Yes, the, the flood protection grant <coughs> scheme. Yes, yes, I, I can. So the, the grant scheme... Well, I'm happy, for you, I'm, happy for you, I'm happy for you to supply that in writing, if that's okay. Absolutely, yes. We can okay. do that in writing, yes. That's okay, that would be useful. Um, just moving on, on just um, to... The, Reservoirs. Obviously, um, this has been something which has been um, long awaited, and, um, and and while it hasn't actually been enacted as such or, or hasn't been commenced, um, that as you as you have said, planners are obviously taking this into consideration, and that has caused um, sort of considerable. Um, challenges f for development um, that alongside um, issues around Northern Ireland water have really um, uh, sort of choked development in many many towns and villages. Um, could you give me some more information as to um, an anticipated timeline um, for the commencement of, of these orders because obviously we're going through going to have to go through a period of consultation um, and so really I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that if there are a considerable number of these, which I'd like you to share the number as well, um, are they going to be um, brought through um, as one, um, or are we going to have this sort of drip feed of um, of um, SRs throughout a, a protracted period of time? Um, no, I hear you, Chair. Uh, maybe if I could just. Uh uh, ask Mark to come in in terms of the timeline, but in terms of the actual commencement of the Act, uh, our Minister is minded really to stand up the, the key safety elements of the Act, um, so that will be our priority in terms of bringing forward the orders, orders and regulations to, to stand up that process uh, and to take it forward. Uh, maybe if I could ask Mark to, to take us through the, the, the proposed timeline at this, this, at this stage. Um, yes, Chair. Um, we would expect that an SL1 would go to the committee sort of around March, hopefully. Um, and then there would be a, a consultation document issued, um, possibly a targeted consultation. Um, and then following that, um, we would be hoping to make sort of negative res resolution or negative resolution commencement orders on uh, the draft affirmative resolution commencement orders around September, October. And then, of course, there would be negative and draft affirmative regulations that would have to come through, and we would hope that they would be made around November, December of next year. And, and will that be taken then? That will be just primarily in relation to um, getting this started and the safety aspect without actually then looking at sort of designation, supervision, inspection, and so on. That will come after that? Yeah. Uh, abs yes. Absolutely, and, and sorry, absolutely, and you know, if if that time, if we get through that timeline, then you know, January the following year, we would be would be looking at the sort of re the uh, registration 
and reservoir owners, for example, have six months to register, and, and then we get into the designation and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so we're really talking about sort of moving towards the next mandate before this will then really be in place? Potentially. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, it will, sorry, Mark. Uh, it will. Uh, it will take time. Potentially, uh, it is a you know significant piece of legislation. Um, I guess the other thing, just to, to add to the, the committee's attention, is um, uh, that this is sort of an additional burden, if you like, it, you know, on top of the the department's baseline resource to to take forward. It uh, uh, will require uh, sort of effort. Uh, it will require people uh, and expertise to help us. Um, Bring this forward, and that's something we'll be working obviously with the, within the department and with the minister to to, to secure that resource. But um, this is a significant piece of work. It's important. To, our minister absolutely recognises. You know, this is all about the safety of you know, people's safety, um, the environment's safety, uh, and it's absolutely something that we're we're trying to get after in terms of commencing. But clearly, we're, we've got a timeline that we need to to follow and a process we need to follow as we um, take these orders and regulations through the necessary, um, you know. Channels. Okay. Well, just just finally, I, I, what concerns me from from your briefing is the fact that you have identified that at least um, nine reservoirs require urgent minimum intervention, and that not all managers that you have contacted have responded positively, and you ha still have issues remaining in and around that. So what, what action? What action can I know? Under, I appreciate that action is limited in the absence of this, but at the same time, there are clearly um, problems that aren't being addressed. So, Chair, maybe if I can come in here just from a, a river's perspective, we have been engaging with, with the managers of those reservoirs where we can. Uh, there's a situation where there's actually a couple of reservoir managers don't acknowledge that they own or manage the reservoir. And so what we're doing is we're trying to investigate is there any other enforcement powers that may be available to us to try and get at least the, the, that minimum level of work undertaken. And we've already commenced that process and we've taken legal advice on that. But it's a very, <coughs> it's a very uh, slow process and it's certainly uh, something, for example, like the drainage order, it is not what the primary function of that order was ever intended to do. Now, of the nine reservoirs, there have been some managers who have responded positively and have agreed to undertake the works, and some of them actually have the works completed. So we're very much aware of, of the issues, and we're doing all that we can to try and close down that risk. But I think it would be fair to say that in the absence of the legislation, that there is a risk that does remain in relation to, to reservoirs and flood Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Buchanan? Thank you. I'll just run through it. There's a couple of quick questions, gentlemen. Um, we talked there, the Chair talked about the Homeowner Flood Protection Scheme. Am I correct in saying that that scheme only covers the actual dwelling and not the perimeter of the dwelling? Yes, the scheme was designed to, to protect the dwelling. Uh, there, may have, there may have been some discussions around some dwellings where it could have been proved that the house could have been properly protected safely at the perimeter. That may have been considered as part of an overall discussion, but principal objective of the scheme is to actually apply products to, to the home. Well, is that something you could look at, Jonathan? Because I had two, two schemes, well, two p people outside in my area, and they had to build, one had to build a wall, one had to build a bank at considerable cost, and which was going to be more cost effective to them to do that than putting something on their dwelling, because it wouldn't have stopped the problem, but they couldn't avail of any support. Is that something you could look into, to develop it to you know, the perimeter of the dwelling? For example, obviously in a rural, it works better in rural areas than it does urban. We, we could look into that. There were some limitations in, ter in, in terms of what we could do, uh, but obviously it would be bounded by the department's best use of its own finances in relation to the grant scheme. But we certainly could look into that. Yeah. Okay, and then just on the chair's point as well, she sort of took all, took all my questions. <laughs> Regarding um, the, the reservoirs, you refer to those nine reservoirs. Is there any risk to life or property at the minute with those nine reservoirs? Well, in the inundation zone of almost all reservoirs, there, there is property that's located. Um, and therefore, with that, then there's a, there is a risk to life and property if that reservoir was to catastrophically collapse or fail. Um, so that is, it's, it's with that in mind, uh, you know, those years ago was what brought forward the, the need for the Reservoirs Act, and it is what has meant 
is the reason why the department has taken forward what it has done in the absence of the act being fully commenced to try and address those issues. But there is a risk. But is there a risk to those nine? A greater risk? Or a considerable yes, risk? Or what, what is it on your risk register, those nine? Medium, high, or low? Well, we have looked at those reservoirs and we've actually employed specialist reservoir engineers to look at it. And their view is that they are either in poor or in very poor condition and that there are urgent actions that need to be undertaken to reduce that risk. And that's, that's the, the language that they use to describe the risk. And then what, what we have done once we've had possession of that information is approach the managers where we could of those reservoirs with a view to them undertaken what works they would need to, to try and reduce the risk of reservoir safety. Okay, and then the final question is on, on um, flood risk. You know the way obviously council lays with your sales regarding flood risk in an area, and the person putting in the application does not always like what they hear, then they get their own flood risk assessment done. Yes. What communication between that council and your department with respect to an individual person getting their own flood risk assessment done, how does that tie up? Well, very often what happens is that if a developer wants to undertake their own flood risk assessment and perhaps you know, challenge a view yeah. that the department might have in relation to the flood risk that pertains to their site, they are very often engaged directly with our staff in our advisory unit. And that would then be taken into account in any planning consultation response that we might give. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, in relation to the nine reservoirs where uh, urgent interventions are required, is it possible you could name those reservoirs? Uh, not off the top of my head, no. Uh, but I could provide information if that, that was needed. It would be useful if you could provide that information to the committee. And also, see the people who are living at the risk of flooding, have they been advised of this risk? We have engaged with the councils um, as part of our emergency planning processes to advise them just in relation to the condition of the reservoirs in each council area and to make sure that we are we're fully cited on, on the risk that, that, that is presented. But individual homeowners have not, have not been uh, advised, no. Would it be good practice to advise them of that, that that risk exists, especially since some reservoir owners are turning around and saying they have no responsibility around it all? Well, we don't normally advise individual homeowners in relation to flood risk from, from any source, and our way to deal with that is actually through our well-established emergency planning processes. So if the situation was to develop, we would know how to respond with our other multi-agency partners to get out that message in, in a timely fashion. We just have concern that we have a, a quite a serious issue here uh, that needs to be addressed. And I do welcome when you said about the potential to bring forward grant funding, but the timescales around that, you know, what, what are they? Because to rectify some of these reservoirs is going to require grant funding to some of the owners, and that we're going to need to bring that forward as soon as possible. Is there any idea in terms of outline timescales when that grant funding would be available? Um, um, well, that's. Um, we pick up on that. Oh, please, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I suppose um, we need to make the regulations before we can introduce the grant program. So, as we've outlined the indicative timeline, regulations um, wouldn't be coming in until the end of next year. So the earliest that a sort of grant program could kick in would be the, the January of the following year, at the very earliest, and that's subject to the timeline. Okay, just very concerned about the delays around this. And in terms of transfer of functions, obviously it required the uh, assembly and the executive to be restored for that to occur. But that occurred in January. Why is there a delay in terms of the transfer of functions? Um, really, it's, uh, there's been a process of um, uh, the DARA minister having to um, uh, agree to release the responsibility for the act, um, our own minister agreeing to accept the act, and then the executive office processing the transfer of functions order. Um, and that takes time in terms of briefing, scheduling. Um, and, uh, and indeed get scheduling time with the, with the Assembly. Um, so our latest information is that the um, process hopefully um, should be complete by um, early in the new year, uh, January. Right. It defies belief, frankly, that it takes a year to do it. 
I know the government moves slowly in Northern Ireland but for a year to transfer the functions. I'm sorry, that takes me to the sign. Um, in relation to the, the last issue, the, the flooding that occurred in the northwest in August 2017 and also in Newcastle in August of this year, was there any lessons learnt in relation to that? And if possible, could they be shared? Yes. Uh, so in relation to the flooding that occurred in August 17, there was a very comprehensive review undertaken, uh, a multi-agency review, and there were 14 recommendations that were identified in order to further improve our emergency response on, on, on wider issues in relation to flood risk. Uh, th those recommendations have all been progressed, and <coughs> 10 of them are completed. Um, in relation to the Newcastle flooding, there again was a multi-agency debrief, and the lessons that could be learned as a result of that incident have been captured with the view then to building them into our uh, existing emergency response procedures. And so we can share with the committee the North West review recommendations and some of the key uh, learning from the Newcastle flooding was used to debrief also. Thank you. I think it's important, Chair, we get a list of those reservoirs. So. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Hildage, step to Chair. Thanks, Chair. I think in 30 years as an elected representative, I've seen the good and the bad and the ugly of flooding over the years, I have to say. Uh, the Joy Mount uh, flood alleviation scheme in Kerry was a great success, I have to say, in, in alleviating the problem in the town centre. But as a as an elected representative, just thinking off the top of my head, the last three, four, maybe five flooding incidents that I've been involved in, it's all been down to human feelings, and human feelings at a certain level of officialdom, wherever that may lie. For instance, when a new development is built on a hill above all our housing, the hard surface is created, and then there's not enough gratings or drains put in, and the next thing, the lower development is, is flooded. And actually, the minister this year had to step in a case like that to get it actually rectified at the end of the day. All other, other things include developments feeding in the other developments, and instead of the pipes getting potentially smaller as they go back, sorry, they're getting smaller as they go forward. So the very first phase development has a smaller pipe, the second one goes maybe slightly bigger, and so it's all these bigger pipes feeding into smaller diameters, and we've had a couple of them this year as well. So that's down to planning and consultation and who polices all that sort of thing at that end. As soon as you guys make a recommendation to planners, is that the end of it? Or do you still keep an eye on what goes on as far as the potential creating flood areas? So we, we, we provide advice to the planning authorities in relation to, to, to flood risk. And as part of that, there would be an assessment of perhaps surface water flood risk or risk from rivers over the sea. And we would comment as to whether the developer's proposals were acceptable from this point of view or otherwise. In terms of, of, of the developer going forward and undertaking what he has agreed to do, or they have agreed to do, um, the responsibility for placing that would, would fall to the planning authorities. That would be a matter for them. In scenarios we are talking about some developers upstream actually having larger pipes than the pipes that are downstream, it may be that there are larger pipes put into some developments now upstream to actually attenuate water or hold water in those pipes so that it can be released uh, slowly downstream as, as part of a storage solution. So whilst it's counterintuitive perhaps to have larger pipes upstream, sometimes you will see that as part of a wider approach to actually store water in those pipes that then can under gravity discharge at a slower rate whenever the peak of the storm is passed. Because the, the lower pipes down in the lower developments, potentially they can become blocked quicker as well and cause a problem as, as well. So it's maintenance of those pipes as well. Y yes, well if it's a if it's a designated water course and the culvert is designated, we would have a, a cyclical inspection of of those water courses and to carry whatever maintenance would be necessary. But if there's a particular water course or development that you have in mind, uh, we'd be very happy to, to look at that. If yeah, and I have to be honest now, the, the guys, I think they work out of Lisbon, is that right, the drainage guys? Yes. Yeah, yes. They, have, they have been very helpful and, that, and they've been very good actually in, in some places. Is it also correct that where there's a drainage system running underneath the property of the house and the grounds of the house, that owner is responsible for making sure that that drain is operating correctly? 
if, if the, the, the drain is not a designated water course, the maintenance responsibility would fall to whoever um, whoever's the property owner to which the water course will yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you're very welcome. Jonathan uh, and Mark, um, Damien. Just a couple of points. Just on the Belfast Tidal Scheme, there's, um, there's a legal challenge there to the process that's been set aside. Can, can you elaborate on that? or you let us speak? I, I can elaborate a little bit on it. So there was a, <clears throat> excuse me, a legal challenge brought by an economic operator who wasn't included in the select list of, of economic operators that would be considered um, going forward to have the tender documents issued to them. Um, that brought about an automatic stay uh, to the procurement process, which would inevitably have delayed the, the procurement, the full procurement of that project on the commencing on site. And subsequently then that would have exposed Belfast City Centre to a longer period of, of flood risk from the sea. So on balance, it, it, it was felt best to set aside that issue and progress with the procurement and that is what we have done um, having received legal advice on that point with a view then to progressing the project as, as quickly as possible. Okay and say uh, Donald or maybe Damien in terms of Brexit the the composition of some of those uh, European regulations that are now local in terms of flood uh, are we are we happy enough to follow those regulations or what assurances can we give that you know we're, we're that high standard set this yeah well um those will uh, uh, continue certainly um what's um uh decision phase ends um i guess it will be uh, over to the uh, the uk government in terms of what legislation what um uh, alterations to uh, regulations they uh, they bring forward following the end of transition phase um that will be something that we'll be conscious of, uh, and, uh, and, and I guess yourselves as, as, as a committee and the executive will be um, keen to react to um, uh, and be part of uh, as it develops. Yeah, and just obviously another point, and Jonathan, you, you will know Clay Lake and Katie very well, um, and it's just a point that uh, was raised earlier on by Mr. Buchanan in relation to uh, developers and flood risk assessment. Some of them are not that keen. They find out when they go through the process and then, and the reason why I mentioned my own town, because it's, it's easy understood, is that the lake is tw a mile out, nearly a mile out of the town, but the far end of the town, they have to do a flood risk assessment, like a mile away. And, and the point is, and I'm not arguing that point, the point I'm saying is clearly the developers only find out about this when they go to, go to put in an application, which is grand. But my main point is, obviously we're doing the local development plans now. What are you doing in terms of working with the, the councils on the development of the local area plans? Because, I mean, each area plan is going to indicate the number <coughs> of units, housing units are going to be built over the next, next say, 10 to 15 years. And, yes. and is that message getting out there to the developers a <coughs> part of the new process to make sure that gets out there? Cause, but I, I do understand the issue in terms of flood risk. But I'm just wondering what engagement and what discussions you have in, uh, in terms of the area plans. We have, we have very good engagement with all of the planning authorities on the development of their local development plans. We've actually a, 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 designated, a designated officer in uh, Rivers that engages with all of the councils. We've provided guidance to them in relation to the flood risk policies that should be contained in the local development plans. And obviously our flood maps are shared with them present day and, and now climate change maps and we have been able to stress to them the importance of some of our flood risk policies so that there's no deterioration if you like in the policy coverage between the old PPS 15 as we move forward now into the new local development plan process. That said, each council um, has its own autonomy in relation to what it does with our advice but we certainly have good relationships with the councils and we're able to engage very very clearly with them on, on the importance of our policy. In terms of the point you raised about a developer, perhaps not being aware of, of what our requirements might be before he puts the planning application in, we would encourage developers to engage with us as, as early as possible. Our, our flood risk maps are available online. 
quickly they could be they should be able to determine whether their development might be impacted by flood risk or not. And we actually welcome early engagement before developers perhaps spend a lot of money um, assessing flood risk for themselves or aren't aware of perhaps what our requirements are for the flood event process. Okay, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Anderson. Sorry, you're on. Must have still be on mute. Okay, that's me off mute. Um, thank you. Thank you for the presentations this morning and for the information that we have received. And I have previously asked, I don't know whether it was yourself, Damien, or who was in front of the committee, because there's a bit of a bee in my bonnet. I cannot, for the life of me, understand how, when the functions were being transferred in 2016, how we ended up in a situation where we had DERA getting part of the reservoir functions that belonged into the Department for Infrastructure. And I've been asked, I've been asking for an explanation of that, and I really would appreciate receiving that because you know that has made a difficult situation worse for some of us representatives in the area. And I think, just like uh, Mr. Muir, Andrew Muir had said, I think it is shocking that we would have to wait until January of not next year but the following year for a grants uh, system to be put in place, given that we know that in each of our constituencies, my own included in terms of Derry, there have been planning applications where, for instance, much needed investment, whether it's housing development in the Glens in Derry, Fort George, Catalyst Inc., a second building, um, even Colmore Road, uh, where there was a danger of uh, much needed living facilities there, um, independent living facilities being refused because of a policy of catastrophic failure um, that seems to be put in place with regards to the Cregan Reservoir. And when it was assessed what it would amount to in Clamore Road, which is way over a few miles away from Cregan, a public. Now, I am not in any way, because I'm deeply concerned about, um, about flood risks and the need coming from the Northwest and Derry. And of course, but the PPS 15, I think it doesn't allow for uh, a three-tier risk assessment, such an assessment that, that would prioritisation of safety, whilst also stopping, in many ways, the river agency force to make worse case assumptions and compelling a flood risk ascent. So what I am asking, I want an answer, Chair, because I think as a committee we deserve it. How did this mess take place in 2016? That it ended up in DERA and not in the Department for Infrastructure. I'm not saying it's anyone on, uh, on this Zoom or any of you you're responsible, but somebody was responsible in the system for ending up with a mess that is now going to take to maybe 2022 before a possible process is in place that is going to allow for grants even to be given to try to deal with the management of some of these issues and to deal with the whether it is capital, risk, whatever it is required to try and help some of these, uh, you know, some of these problems to be dealt with so that the planning that is applied for can be moved forward. So could we try and find out, Damien? Can we try and find out? Can I get an answer to that one way or another? Can the committee get an answer to that, please, as to what happened? And then I would like to ask another question. Um, certainly, um, I think it might be best if we uh, provide a response in writing, if that's um, uh, sufficient for you. Um, clearly, the, the explanation that we can give now is that really it was it was an inadvertent uh, issue error um, that the uh, reservoirs act was left out of the uh, the transfer function order in 2016. Uh, I don't know right now what the uh, context of why that happened um, or, or what uh, or what led up to that uh, issue um, occurring. Um, but yes, it did happen, uh, and uh, I'll seek to provide a, a better explanation uh, if that's. Uh, 
Okay, okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll await that. And of course, it did happen. But the consequences, Damien, has been that there have been unfolding problems uh, as a result of this. The transfer of functions for, um, from the TEO sort of issue in that, um, we have had to actually go to a number of ministers, including the, the, the infrastructure minister, who's more than willing and needs this actual transfer of function to take place, to the DERA minister to accept that the, you should move that out and to the TEO uh, two ministers to make sure that this has happened. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that had to be put in place around this process. But we all know about accelerated passage and how that can be taken forward. And I think it's absolutely necessary, given that there was a month of fundamental mess and cock up made in the situation of trying to see how this can be accelerated to, to be taken forward. In Derry, if I talk, because I know from experience of what we're dealing with, with the Craigan Reservoir, the council has now, uh, they're going to register, if they haven't already done it, be the responsible reservoir management. So that then they can get a designation if that's going to be low, medium or high, and then the ongoing supervision. So we're aware of the process that needs to take place. However, in order for the developments, whether it is in Fort George, whether it is the A2, whether it is McGee, whether it is the Glen's housing development, much needed housing development that was required then, a community centre. I could go on and list other possible um, investment and developments and others could do the same. Then there needs to be some support given to the council in order for them to take forward the work that needs done to the reservoir to fulfil what was put in and by the assessment about the problems that it could cause. It may not be catastrophic, in fact, not catastrophic, but problems enough that's going to prevent developments taking place. So in that way, I think that, for instance, Council Barry, and I'm assuming the other councils that would be applying for this grant, can wait until January 2022, if I heard you right uh, from Andrew, that that would be when that grant would kick in. So are there any possibilities that could be put in front of us as other ways that this could be accelerated? Um, well, we're, uh, we have to carefully step through what a grant uh, looks like. Um, we're in the process of looking at options. Um, our minister is minded in terms of considering what those options look like. Uh, but we also have to be mindful in terms of who's eligible for the grant, and that will all form part of uh, the analysis that we'll, uh, we'll undertake. Um, for example, uh, an organisation like uh, Derry Straban Council, um, you know, clearly as, as reservoir owners, um, I guess they know that the Act is, uh, or will know that the Act is, is coming down the line. Um, we can inform them of, of the obligations of, of what the Act will, will bring in terms of as our owner and, and the safety regime that it's expected alongside that. Uh, I guess what I'm saying, there's there's nothing to stop reservoir owners sort of taking action in terms of trying to address safety concerns with assets that they're in possession of uh, now in advance uh, well, Dave, of the act come down the line. And I don't want to interrupt you, but um, I think you're probably aware, as we all are as members, that every council is struggling because of COVID. So it's, it's actually, it's of course they need they know their obligations. They know what needs to be done in terms of the safety regime. They simply do not have the uh, finances and they're looking for some support. Now, I think it needs a cocktail of support where, for instance, I have been going to the Department of Communities. Not that it's their responsibility, it is not. But unfortunately, for instance, the planning applications have went in, even though they're handing over and giving over some of their assets for development, it's impacting on whether it is Fort George, it's impacting on the Glens, it's impacting on the industry, it's impacting on the potential development of McGee and Gary. So um, until we get, for instance, this grant scheme put in place, then for councils like that to be able to take it forward that are strapped at this moment in time. We know that the finance minister has recently given 10 million to help councils with their operational running costs and all, all the other functions that they need to do during COVID. So it's not that just that councils need to understand the obligations that they're taking. Councils are acutely aware of those obligations, but they don't have the finances. And unless we come up with a cocktail of funding, perhaps 
if the the minister for infrastructure at this moment is not able to for instance trigger the, the grant regime but maybe through another method that we could find support to be able to allow necessary development. There is no point in us saying build back better and we're going to have some kind of recovery, hopefully coming out of this virus if there is a vaccine now that has given us a little bit of hope going into the future. And then we find something like a reservoir in Derry and other reservoirs, the nine that Andrew and also uh, asked for the names of, that they are all, they are actually stopping development taking place, stopping houses from being built, stopping Thank any you. kind of... Ms. Anderson, could you, bring your, could you bring your remarks to conclusion? I'm very conscious of time. I'm sorry, Chair, but I have been asking for this on this committee as a minister or as, as a member to try and give some answers about this, and it's something that I, I really want to talk about. I, I apologise for that, but that's the question. I mean, I'm asking, I'm asking if we can if come together to try to get a cocktail for funding for councils like Derry and elsewhere, if it's not going to be the ground. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, moving then to Ms Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, um, and, and thank you for, for such a, a comprehensive presentation. I suppose the questions I have are around um, the, the issues about climate change, and, and we know this will have an impact on flood risk. Um, how much of a challenge will that be for here in the north, um, where we already have significant challenges anyhow? And have we any idea about how much additional investment would be needed um, to combat this as part of the, the current climate emergency? Um, okay, maybe if I just pick up in terms of climate change and, uh, and how it's informing the, uh, the plan. So, yep, climate change data, it's obviously changing, it's, it's moving, it's an ever um, sort of evolving piece of work. Um, but we are, are obliged to consider um, climate change data and forecasts in our flood risk management plans. Uh, and I just, as I briefed the, the committee earlier, um, our flood risk management plan so on the cusp of a, of a new cycle, um, we will be commissioning them for publishing to them for um, consultation uh, at the, near the end of de December. Um, and really, prior to that, uh, in February 2019, um, the department introduced new technical flood risk guidance um, in relation to allowances for, for climate change. Um, and that, that's being used at the minute in terms of uh, design for uh, flood alleviation and drainage infrastructure schemes. Uh, so it, it is it is something we're conscious of, and it's been, it's, it's having a practical impact in, in, in terms of designs and, and planning at this point in time, and it will be embedded further into our flood risk management plans as we look forward uh, over the next six year cycle. Um, so uh, hopefully that gives you just a brief introduction in terms of the policy side of it. Um, Maybe if Jonathan, you want to say something in terms of the practical application. Yes, yes thank, thank you, David. So. Um, for example, the scheme we're taking forward at the minute, like Belfast Tile or the Uri Flood Aviation Scheme, they're already taking into account climate change in the design flows, and that's based on the latest guidance that the department has place. <coughs> We've also developed climate change flood maps, which we're now starting to use increasingly in development management and will inform the local development plans. The challenge will be as climate change predictions perhaps increase in the future. That may mean that we have to consider greater design flows in, in rivers, for example, which could mean that we need to have additional investment. And therefore, that is all the more important. That means that it's all the more important that we avoid development in known areas of progress for those likely to be impacted by climate change going forward to reduce the risk to homeowners and business from future progress and to avoid storing up a, a huge capital investment problem for the future as well. Thank you. Um, and just, uh, uh, um, you mentioned some of the flood alleviation schemes there, but I couldn't really hear. So it's just uh, um, the Newcastle one, which is, has been particularly prominent recently. Um, yes. People are still waiting on the commencement of the, the Shimna Road flood alleviation scheme. Is there any update on that, of when that can be expected? Sorry if I missed that. Yes, the Shimna flood alleviation scheme is to be on site in the summer of next year, although as members will know, the Minister has asked us to accelerate the project as quickly as possible and we can do that. Um, it's due to go out to tender very shortly and it's hoped likely that we'll commence some of the enabling works with the trees um, in the near future as well. So we're doing all we can to just reduce that time frame to get it on the site 
and then wherever it is on site to try to reduce the, the construction as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Kelly. <laughs> Chair, thanks very much, and thanks for the presentation. And uh, probably uh, you will expect uh, around the Reservoirs Act some commentary in relation to when's a reservoir not a managed reservoir, because it has had significant impact in my constituency in terms of uh, development. I've raised it here before. Um, but I understand that one of the delays was in relation to uh, not only COVID, but also the resources within your own agencies uh, in relation to expert advice that uh, I think a panel engineer had to be brought in from England to make assessments. I'm talking specifically about Lurgan Park Lake. But I just wonder around resources within your department uh, or areas of responsibility. Um, have you had a significant shortfall uh, following, I suppose, some of the voluntary exit schemes that were in place a couple of years ago, and if, the, if that experience and expertise uh, will be in house, or will that always be something that is bought in? Maybe David, if I might lead off on this, if that's okay. So, um, in, in, in relation to, to, to the reservoirs issue, we have found ourselves dealing with a, a greater number of reservoirs issues in the absence of, of, of the act being fully commenced than we ever envisaged and then as well as that some of the complications in around planning has been very resource intensive from a, a river's point of view that that has meant that we haven't had the resources that we would like to, to address some of these issues at the rate that we would like but nevertheless we have made progress but we recognize that to sustain that progress and to actually be prepared for the the, the act being commenced, we need additional resource. Um, my staff and Damien's staff have worked very closely to develop a fuller understanding of what that might be, and we've had some preliminary discussions with, with the Minister on the issue as well, um, just around some of the resources that would be needed to, to deal with the technical and administrative issues around reservoirs issues as they stand presently and what they will be in the future. In terms of the specific expertise that's needed to evaluate reservoirs and their condition and, and what works are necessary, that's a very specialist area of civil engineering. There is no one within the department that has that expertise and therefore it's more cost effective for us to, if you like, bring that in. There's a pool of engineers that we can draw off and, and provide us with that necessary guidance and expertise. Um, and and we're, we're able to do that and we've set up a number of arrangements whereby um, reservoirs that the department would manage can be inspected and maintained appropriately, and therefore, and as well as that, other inspections that we would want to carry out on other reservoirs where we think there may be a risk that we can again draw on that specialist expertise. So, we have access to specialist reservoir engineers, but there's most definitely a need for additional resource to to manage the full requirements of of the reservoir issue as it stands and the legislative piece that will go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Beggs. Uh, again, thanks for your uh, update. Um, you've indicated it's a slow process to transfer the function, incredibly slow, and, and given the fact a risk to life potentially has been highlighted to us, uh, I think uh, we as a committee need to uh, progress that matter uh, with the Executive Office initially and then subsequently with the Department. But you've indicated nine... Uh, urgent interventions that require um, to, to reduce the risks, and 26 others uh, have an area of a degree of concern. Now, one thing you seem to be saying was that you've engaged with the manager in these nine urgent cases where you're aware of them. Can you advise many of them where you haven't been able to identify, and can you clarify that do you, that the, the owner has the responsibility? Are they not deemed to be the manager in the absence of anybody else being nominated? So, whenever the, the reservoir audit was, was, was undertaken in 2016, it identified 45 reservoirs that were in poor or very poor condition. And we engaged with reservoir managers once we were in possession of that information to encourage them to fulfil their common law responsibility to ensure that the reservoirs were safe. That meant that some progress was made and ultimately, ultimately then, about a year or 18 months ago, we were concerned about 
26 reservoirs and we felt we needed more information just to really understand how great is the risk around those and we carried out inspections using the specialist engineers that I, that I mentioned earlier. And that identified nine reservoirs where there was uh, urgent interventions needed. We've engaged with, with those managers where we can and what I mean by that is there, there are two managers who would dispute that they are actually the reservoir manager but nevertheless that we believe that they are and therefore their common law responsibility remains. In relation to those two reservoir managers, we're, as I said earlier, we're looking at what other legislative means we could bring to bear to enforce them carrying out the works that we deem that they need to carry out. But as you'll all appreciate at this stage in our discussion, in, in the absence of the legislation, it's very limited what we can do really when it comes to dealing with the full range of, of matters that need to be undertaken in all reservoirs in the interest of safety. So this is very much us um, exploring to the very best of our ability what we can do to reduce that risk. Can you explain why there's a dispute over who is, uh, has responsibility? Because that it must be exceptionally dangerous when no one is taking responsibility in a, in a, in a risk situation. Uh, is there a dispute over who the owner is? The, the, the owners, as we believe them to be, are disputing that they are actually the owner, um, and it's it, it's difficult, I think, for, for them to prove that. But uh, nevertheless, we're proceeding on the basis that they are the owner. And in your information you're providing us with uh, about these nine sites, can you identify the ones where there's a dispute over ownership, and the public may able be able to assist and uh, and clarifying that. Um, a second area then in, the, in your update, you've talked about the Homeowner Flood Protection Grant. Now I'm aware that this is uh, uh, an increasingly used area in, in other parts of the United Kingdom, particularly because of climate change and the risk to, to widespread flooding, which is more, more difficult to, to predict. Um, so my, my question is, how widely known uh, is this scheme amongst the public and for that matter, public representatives, because I wasn't really aware of it until relatively recently. Well, we have publicised it um, in areas of known flood risk through our regional community resilience group engagement. Um, all councils would have been made aware of it, and there would have been a significant number of elected members would have been aware of, of, of the scheme. Um, one of the recommendations that has emerged from our review is that there was the potential to, to further publicise the scheme and maybe even potentially if, if there was a substantive scheme taken forward to actively engage with known areas of flood risk to take forward, if you like, a scheme of homeowner flood protection. So rather than just one homeowner on a street availing of it and the other members of the street not perhaps looking on a, a, a wider context. We have the advantage here because of our small size and that we can control the scheme for the region which is different to what happens in England where there, there's different approaches in different areas. Um, so we have an opportunity here to build something that is, that is consistent and, and universal for us. And I understand the scheme can be most successful where there is local buy-in and uh, widespread adoption. Uh, so I probably emphasise the importance of engaging with councils more so and in, for that matter the relevant uh, community where there may be a flooding risk. Yes, we, we, we would accept that because um, this project was taken forward as a, as a first step into this area of work, uh, really to learn lessons to see what we needed to do to improve for the future if this was a suitable way of managing flood risk in some certain circumstances. So we, we have learned from the, the first few years of its, of its operation, and then if there's a substantive scheme developed, we'll try and incorporate that learning. So, so your, your comments are very helpful in, in terms of how to shape that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, and thank you all for, for attending this morning. And, and obviously, this was um, quite enlightening. But apart from anything else, I think members collectively are quite concerned in relation to um, the time scales, particularly around um, reservoirs. Um, so we will be following up on that. So, but again, thank you all for attending this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, Thanks. just. Just in regard to that, um, are you content that we, we write to the Minister um, outlining our concerns, particularly around how um, 
reservoirs are going to be addressed, um, the time scale of that. Um, I suppose what concerns me is the fact that this may not be taken through as a package, but that it may be just that they will look at each aspect of this individually and consult. Perhaps that we should ask them to look at this as a, a collective package of, of orders so that uh, we can then look alongside having a, a grant scheme then worked up um, so that we're not then starting them from scratch again. Um, once yeah. the orders are, are, are put in place, our members content that we, that we do that and we Great ask them to yeah. look at that with some urgency. Uh, yeah. Content we write to the Minister, but I think we should also write to the Executive Office, because I understand that's where the bottleneck is, to get the transfer order. Mm. Well, the, yeah, it, well, um, well, yeah. What has been indicated yeah. was that this was to be um, with us, obviously, by mid-December, and now we're moving into early January, so uh, I'm con content to do that as well, so that we can get a definitive date. We have been asking about this from, I think, our first meeting back in January, so it's not as though the committee hasn't been asking questions, um, but there is a, there is a, certainly a tardiness um, with respect to this. Uh, Ms. Chair, Anderson? Yes, certainly. Chair, the transfer of order has already um, made its journey out of the Executive Office. It's already come to the um, the TEO committee, so um, there's no bottleneck when it comes to the executive office. And in fairness to the other two ministers, the DRA minister and the minister for infrastructure is the DRA minister is moving, and the minister for infrastructure is accepting what's coming her way. So it's the slowness um, in the system, and like you say, we all have been asking questions. I don't think we have been getting answers. And if we have some reservoirs, and I only mention mines and dairy because I know it extensively well, uh, that the council has taken on the responsible reservoir management of that now, then we do need to make sure that the work that needs done in terms of the safety work, that there is some kind of grant. And I would say, Chair, I was trying to get to the officials. I'm sorry for taking so long, but I was coming to the end of my question, and I do not take kindly to whoever is controlling the moot to muting me before I got answer, asking no. the very last few words of my question, and I asked that that is not done again to any member, including myself. Well, certainly, it's, there's no control in the in the committee room with regards to mute, so I don't have access to that. So well, there's somebody control. Somebody took turned me off. Just as I was coming to the question, and I didn't get asking, and they did, or they didn't pick up that I was asking outside of the grant that Andrew had rightly been able to glean for us all. That's not going to come into place to 2020. I know there's areas like my own can't wait that long, and I think that should be part of the what we're bringing to the minister's attention. I think that's sort of reflected around with, with all members with regards to um, all of the areas, um, but certainly just for all members that I don't have control of a mute button. <laughs> 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 so, but can I say, we do try to keep our remarks. You know, we know we're limited under COVID for a short period of time, and I think we do try to show courtesy to other members by keeping our remarks uh, focused. Yeah, it was it was a very lengthy briefing that we did receive from um, officials today, and it was very detailed. And I did say to members at um, at twelve o'clock when we started the questions that we or eleven o'clock when we started the questions. <laughs> that we only had an hour so whenever I say that I can I would like members to be um, cognizant of that when they are asking questions and I appreciate that everyone we were very um, we're very good in the committee and that we all participate but sometimes that means that, it, 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 that others then have to maybe curtail their, their questions at times so um, okay and, so and there we, we also need to take account when we are getting extensive briefings and they come in and there's a half an hour of a briefing it only means it means that for all of us we are curtailed and by the time it gets to some of it you know you're you're running against a clock but i take your point okay. but there are some issues that some of us are feeling quite um you know extensively involved in and therefore that probably reflects how long it takes to answer the question I appreciate, I appreciate that and it's not i appreciate that okay so but if we're all mindful of that in the, in yeah. the future okay so if members are content that we do we do write to the minister in relation to this um, there are a couple of members of the business committee on, on this committee, so yeah. perhaps you might look at this with regards to scheduling of 
um, debate because it does say that there is an issue in relation to scheduling in the assembly. So well, unless Chinese it hasn't the, come to there's the lack of yeah, absolutely no issue. Yes. For three weeks, we have asked uh, the, through the speaker for the legislative timetable from TEO, and they have yet to reply. Mr. Beggs. Yeah, I am also aware that this line has been used on a number of occasions, but I am not aware of there been any delay for that matter. Additional settings can be organised no, no, no. coming from from the from okay. the assembly. Okay, so I was agreed, sorry, yesterday that there would be additional no. meetings. Okay. Maybe. Okay, so every, everyone is very defensive of their position on all this, but if, <laughs> if we can if we can move on, I'm content that we've raised this um, obviously okay. with the with the minister, um, because obviously the most important aspect of this will be once the, the we do have those powers within infrastructure that um, the necessary um, orders are made and that they are made in a in a timely manner. Yeah. Okay, moving then to our forward work program, just draw your attention to that at page 249. Unfortunately, um, officials are unable to brief the committee on road safety strategy at our meeting next week. Um, this will be rescheduled to the new year. So I've agreed and the members are content that we receive a briefing um, from NIE on the use of electric vehicles and the need for infrastructure in and around that. Um, there, um, we obviously have to send our apologies to Des again, who has two briefings. Nine, yes. So Sorry, if yes. you're content, um, because part of that will actually apply to electric vehicles yes. yeah, infrastructure yeah, yeah. and so on, that we ask Des to brief us at the beginning just on that paper. Yeah, yeah. that's fair um, enough. In, and then um, before we then move through to NIE, if that's uh, if that's acceptable to the clerk. Okay. Okay. Member is content, and the other briefing will be in relation to road procurement and and, and flagship projects. Um, I understand that this won't be with regards to structural maintenance. So, if members are mindful mm. of that, again, whenever we are asking questions of the um, of officials, uh, do members have any other issues which they'd like to raise at this point, Miss Kimmins? Your <laughs> apologies, I was late at the start. Just something came up this morning and delayed me, but. So this may have been raised around the haulage sector. Um, I was just to see was there any further updates because I know when we had um, the officials in, I had asked them to review um, kind of their, like, you know, their conclusion on, on financial support for the haulage sector, and many still haven't got anything. So and, and aren't doing well at all. Um, and I suppose as we hear things like Devon's uh, announcements yesterday, things like that will have an impact. Um, in terms of non-essential retail and, and all of that. So it was to see, was there any further progress with that? Um, because they had said that they felt there wasn't evidence there, but, but we were saying that we recognise that, you know, some haulage companies are doing okay, but there's still quite a number that aren't at all. So I think it's important that we keep that on the agenda and, and try and get an update on that. Okay, if members can tell, we can mm -hmm. follow up on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, just before we leave, if um, just make sure you maintain your social distancing, take all your papers and so on with you. Um, the next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Oh. in uh, the Senate Chamber on Wednesday, the 9th of December. Um, meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.